Hello and welcome to Black Dog Podcast, episode 311. I'm Lee. I'm Darren. I'm Jim. I'm Elton. Yes, and here we are with a high energy opening because I think it's generally safe to say everyone's had a shit week. So, <laughs> so, so we'll have so we'll have a quick chat about how our week's been, and um, then we'll move on to um, the glory, the 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 work of cinematic genius that is Life Force, our movie this week that we'll be revisiting. But before, obviously, we get to that, yeah. Let's see how everyone's week's been. Who wants to go first? <laughs> I just well, just someone pick a pick a side and go. It's just the first person to pull a trigger, really, isn't it? Well, there you go. <laughs> well, well done, Elton. Oh, fucking hell, I've done it again. Okay, well, um, how's your week? Um, I started a new job this week. Ooh, and quite enjoying it at the moment so everything's two thumbs fresh for that oh i'm i'm trying to uh, we we don't use the digi pen that i had on the last two companies which is like a, a bluetooth pen that sends your sheets to the phone and then to the office they they use tablets now oh technology and, and everything yeah and they're they're quite hard to get used to which is uh, a bit of a stumbling block at the moment, but I'll get there. I'll, I'll work it out. You can do and, it, Elton. We we yeah. believe in you. I'm, I'm. Well, yes. If anyone could, then it would be me. I feel. Yeah, yeah, definitely, without a doubt. <laughs> It'll be you, man. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that's good. That's all hunky dory. Uh, mm-hmm. Today in the post, mm-hmm. uh, I I had a little um dive on Amazon. Uh, oh yeah. Which I I totally forgot about. Uh, yeah, about a week ago, mm-hmm. and I purchased some Bluetooth headphones. Ooh, Ooh. and they they turned up today. Nice. Uh, they're they're very cheap, but that's all I wanted. I just wanted some Bluetooth, real cheap ones that I can knock around at work, and so I don't have to worry about the wires around mm-hmm. there. Yeah, and it's nice when you forget you've ordered stuff, and suddenly it turns up on your doorstep. The Amazon fairy turns up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And with my memory going that way, I'm going to have lots of surprises turning up, I'm sure. (laughs) Four of them. (laughs) Exactly. Uh, Well, these headphones have turned up. And, well, it turns out I need to learn Japanese in my left ear and English in my right ear. What? The, What? The left one speaks to me in Japanese. And the right one speaks to me in English. (laughs) How is this even possible? (laughs) Well, when you turn them on, it says power on. Right. In, in, let's say, the right ear. Mm. But it says power on in Japanese in the left ear. Or what I think is power on in (laughs) in Japanese. Um, Right. When you turn to power on them off, the right ear says power off in the right ear. The left one says power off in Japanese. So so what is power off in Japanese then, Elton? Uh well I if it was loud enough <laughs> I, I'm gonna I'm gonna crank up my microphone. It probably won't come through, but hang on a second. Okay. Oh, oh, you're gone. Oh, that's English. Shit. Hang on. Hold on. Go on. Katie. <laughs> yeah, Katie. What the, what the fuck? <laughs> nice. At least he's in. Scroll your gadget. <laughs> <laughs> he probably is saying that. Uh-uh. In some, in some uh, a sort of weird abstract version of Mandarin, just, <laughs> just to fuck us all up. Yeah, so um, that's weird. Yeah. When it says connected, it says connected in English in one ear and connected in Japanese or something in the left ear. Nice. Well, so, okay. Wow. Well, it's different. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly I, is. I mean, as as far as it goes, it's a it's gonna it's gonna aid your um your um Japanese. Japanese speaking, you planning on a holiday in Japan anytime I'm, soon? 
Well, I might as well now. I know half of it. Crying out loud. <laughs> you know how to say power on, power off. That's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yes. Mm. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that's it. So, so how are the headphones otherwise? They're not translating everything into Japanese, are they? No, no, no. They, um, they're working. So I'm quite happy with that. Um, hmm. it's, I'm going to be using them just for around work and while I do the lawn mowing outside. So just, just gets rid of all them stupid wires I have, but we shall see anyway, see how it goes. So I will report back when I find out more. Okay, well... I'm a bit untrusting of Bluetooth headphones because you can easily get your, your iPod pickpocketed out of your pocket and it's not until they're three miles down the road that you realise the thing's gone. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah. As soon as it starts to go ip up, ip up, ip up, ip up, yeah. up, and you're thinking, hang on, <laughs> it's in my pocket. Oh, fuck. <laughs> It must. You have to run around in circles until the signal gets stronger. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to locate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice. Like some version, the weird version of the crystal maze. I you suppose know. you could actually track them, though, couldn't you? In that case, <laughs> yeah. sort of like, quick, run in the direction of the music. <laughs> where's, it, where's it getting better? <laughs> yeah. Oh no, no, it's breaking up far more now. Hold on, hold on. No, no, go, go this way. Oh, look, I can hear more of it. I can hear it. <laughs> oh shit! And then got... you're getting Japanese messages in in one ear, <laughs> in English messages yeah. as they both disconnect. Yeah, connecting, disconnecting, connecting, disconnecting. Nice. <laughs> 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 so, uh, yeah, that was. Pretty much my week. Oh, and I bumped into Mr. Barnard for a drinky poos at Jocelyn's drinky poos. Yes, oh yes, in the Admiral. So I'll I'll let him say that anyway. So okay, okay, okay. Then well then let's move on to Mr. Jim. How was your week, sir? Uh, been a bit of a pain. Um, <laughs> yep. I found Skype had been hacked. My address had been spoofed, which was fun to deal with after a couple of bottles of wine on a Saturday night. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> I'd rather know. Than go, oh, fucking hell. Yeah. Um, if it does happen to you, it's prob- I'll save you the problem, the uh, trouble of lengthy malware and antivirus scans, as I did some research. And apparently this happens a lot, and they get in through fucking Skype. Oh, Jesus. And old Skype have said, oh, you know, where there's a problem, there's some engineers working on it. Fucking too right. Sort it out. Apparently it's been going for about two years, so oh, brilliant. So well done. Really, so, um, really working on it. <laughs> yeah. And, the, you know, it's change your password is the official line on it. Brilliant. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Um, I also had the worst shopping experience uh, uh, I think I've had in a long time today. Yeah. I'd, uh, I've would i been in, uh, in town this morning doing one of my little jobs I do at the local library. And um, I was hurrying home, catching the bus. I just missed one, so in about five minutes, I need some bread and milk. There's a Tesco, inverted commas, express. <laughs> I yeah. went in. Firstly, I can't get the milk aisle because there's two staff um, stacking, again, inverted commas, i.e. fucking about and talking, so I can have to go around and get the milk. Yeah. Bread aisle, blocked off again. Two members of staff. One member of staff on till serving some miserable old fucker who's made it his life's work to take as long as possible with three items. And I'm there thinking, oh, for fuck's sake, this is ridiculous. It's, I've already had to do an assault course just to get the two basic items I need. Yeah. And now this guy, I don't, you know, how are you taking? So, oh, God, he's going for coupons. Oh, he's fucking out of coupons. Right. Mm. The self-service scan. Mm. I scan the milk. Mm. He says, pay now. No, I'm not finished. <laughs> yeah. Try and take the milk out. It won't have it. And he goes, assistance is coming and starts bleeping. At which oh, this point, no. I just flung the stuff down and said, oh, fuck this. <laughs> Slightly louder than I intended <laughs> and stormed out. <laughs> Unexpected item in banging area. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unexpected rage in bagging area. <laughs> yeah, the unexpected item is a member of staff with the fucking carton of milk shoved up his ass, <laughs> jammed into the fucking bag that's hanging off the till. So. Yeah. Unbelievable. Nice. <clears throat> However, I will round off this with a, a heartwarming story. I oh, yeah. Today. Um, apparently yesterday it was um, 
uh, a parents' evening. Well, a parents' day, actually, as it mm. was. Um, uh, for my niece, who is six. Right. And my sisters, were, you know, went in, you know, to do it at the night, they have it during the day. So, you know, she went in and, uh, you know, she was looking at what little Jessica's been doing mm-hmm. and looks at what she'd be doing that very morning. Yep. And apparently they'd been set the task of um, writing down, what would you do if you were a bored rabbit? Mm-hmm. If you're a bunny rabbit and a bored, what would you do? Mm-hmm. And I will read word for word what, what, what Jessica wrote. Go on then. If I was a bored rabbit, I would escape by digging a hole. That's how I would escape from the field. Yeah. If I was a bored rabbit, mm. I would fart on other rabbits so I would not be bored anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Words to live by. <laughs> Beautiful, man. She's Shakespeare. <laughs> fart on other rabbits. Oh man! Yeah, I tell you what, if we still did custom, if we still did custom uh, titles for these things, like that, that would be it. I think <laughs> fart on a rabbit. Nice. Oh uh, yes, yes. She'll go far. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say. I think she's got, she's got she's got comedy she's got comedy writers sorted it already in her career. <laughs> I play Mr. Al. Yeah, he took him to visit her when she was in the hospital. Oh my word! Well, the, yeah. What have you got? Wow. <laughs> You can't, you can't, you can't leave him alone with minors, for God's <laughs> sakes. Have you not learnt, Jim? Have you not learnt these things? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh well, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. Anything else, sir? No, nope, that'll that'll do. That'll me. do you nicely. Someone oh. else rant now. Okie dokie, Darren. Over to you, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, well, well, my, my week's been actually not too bad. Yeah. Started off, of course, on the Friday with uh, um, a drinks uh, with, uh, you know, for Jocelyn's birthday. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, joined by uh, the usual sort of gang of uh, suspects. Mary there. Wales. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yep. And, of course, an appearance by uh, Mr. Elton. Yes. Um, so, yes, good night was had by all there. Cool. Uh, and again, out on Saturday mm. as well, um, into town, you know, yep. uh, more drinks, more mm. memory loss, um, uh, <laughs> more yeah. embarrassment. Oh, yeah. Um, more very strange photographs <laughs> popping up on fucking Facebook as oh, well. Oh, I see. Uh, all because Mr. Chessel was in town. Mr. Yes. Christine Chessel. Yes. Back from the land of the lost or the Isle of Wight, as we like to as, call yeah, it. Yeah, as it's better known. Yep. Yeah, the shrouded island of mist, or Skull <laughs> Island, as I should refer to it from now on, actually. Um, yep. And speaking of which, I yes. uh, I did actually go to the cinema twice this week. Oh, go on. Uh, yeah, first one I went to see uh, was Logan. Yes. So what? got to see that by myself. Um, pretty much like like you, mm. I sat there. It's like, oh, that's sad, isn't it? Uh, you know, when it comes to the sad bits or yep. the supposed there is now a sad bit coming up. You should be sad because it's a sad bit. Yes. So um, it's like, oh, yeah, I can see why somebody would think that's sad. Mm-hmm. Not any effect on me whatsoever. Okie dokie. Didn't blub at all Aww. or anything like this. These are all the points in the movie where I'm supposed to blub. Mm. And it's like, nope. Yep. Not at all. But, but I've got to say, yes, I think this ranks up there with um, X-Men First Class as one of the only other X-Men films that I've been truly happy with. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've, I really enjoyed it. I nice. thought it was a great film. Yeah, I, did. I thought it was great. Do you know one of the biggest surprises in the film was Stephen Merchant for me? Yep. <laughs> I th- I thought because um, normally I mean anybody who's seen Stephen Merchant do anything um, mm. he he kind of plays quite over the top sort of comedy character. In fact, he plays the same character no matter what he does. Yeah. But in this, he 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 played the comedy with a lot more subtlety than he normally does. Mm. Uh, and I I just thought he was really really good in the role as Caliban. Nice. Yeah. He's excellent. Really yeah. excellent. I'm wandering around like fucking Nosferatu. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But he wasn't like the crazy sort of. Mm. It, it wasn't the crazy sort of character he's used to. That I'm used to seeing him as. He yeah. was very, as I say, it, it was very. Um, 
uh, very played down. Yes. So, yeah. There you go. But there um, you the go. other film I saw yes. was Cold Skull Island. Okay. And, yeah, again, really, really enjoyed it. Uh, it was such a fun film to watch. Mm. Um, King Kong is fucking big. Yeah, I mean, he he's is rather really large. big. Yep. <laughs> I mean, I know he's in various different sizes in different films. Mm. Um, it can range, but there is a lovely scene with um, a sort of like a bit of a play on the whole Apocalypse Now mm. thing where, you know, you've got the sun coming up in on the horizon and mm. it shows you the helicopters going into the sun or yeah. coming out of the sun. Yeah. It does that, but it's fucking Kong standing there in full silhouette. Yeah. And it's just literally as the helicopters, there's four helicopters coming towards him. And as they go towards him, you just see everything going dark because <laughs> he's so fucking big. Yeah. But, yeah. um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't, re- don't say too much about it because basically, um, yeah, I'm going to see it on, uh, tomorrow. Hopefully. No, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give away too much. I will yeah. say, um, mm. The action in it, really enjoyed the action. It's mm-hmm. a good um, monster mm-hmm. fighting movie. Mm-hmm. Um, some great action with it. Um, it. I like the fact that they've given Kong himself a bit of intelligence mm. as well. And there's one scene in particular that made me laugh. It's just a look that he t- something happens to him and yeah. he realises what he's got in his hand. Mm. And it's just that... Ah, right, okay. Let's fuck some shit up. And it's it's it really is. It's just just a moment where he pauses for a yeah. second. Yeah. Great stuff. Just decides really. yeah, hold on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, right, well this is a game changer. <laughs> so um you know, it's a bit like that scene in um you know, um Pacific Rim mm. where you've got um he picks up the oil tanker. Oh, yes, and the takes robot. a big old swing at it. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's a bit like that. Mm. But yeah, nice. So, um, the, the special effects and I thought were absolutely stunning. Really, really good. Yeah. Um, and I can see that there's going to be... I mean, there is a post-credit sequence, which I do recommend people stay for. Yeah. Um, personally, it, it, it didn't really surprise me, the post-credit, because I kind of guessed... I hadn't even seen the film, and I kind of guessed what the post-credit sequence was going to be about. Yeah, um, but it was nice to see it. But it, I thought it was going to be one thing, and it actually expanded on quite a few other things as well. And it's like, oh, oh, yeah. there's there's more stuff coming from this yeah. in the future. I can see. So um, I'm really looking forward to that. Okay, cool. I knew so, there yeah. was. I knew there was one. I knew there was one, which is why I sent a, sent a message to you on Facebook. But I didn't. I haven't actually seen it, so I have no idea. <laughs> Mister Plasterdes kind of warned me about it. Yeah, um, he said, you know, stay for the post credits. The only thing is, it's. I mean, I wish they'd do all of these things mid credits rather than wait until the end of the credits now. Yeah. Because some of these credits can be really long, and I'm just sitting there thinking, you know, come on, get on with it. Scroll the thing, scroll the fucking text faster. Let's get to the end. Yeah, yeah. But as 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 someone who would have been a part of that humongous block had my career gone a different way, I have to say, fucking sit down and we'll read them. Yeah, miserable <laughs> git. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, pay, I'm, pay I'm your respects to I... your VFX masters. <laughs> I'm kind, of, I'm kind of glad that I did because in the credits, um, I know they say you shouldn't read them too carefully because there's something in it that will give away what's in the post credit sequence. Oh, right. Rather stupidly. But I did catch somebody's name in there that made me, that made myself laugh. And I actually heard someone from behind me mm. say the name out loud. Oh, it's right. Sort of like a, have I just seen that correctly? There's somebody called Shithole. <laughs> no, Shit hole. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. The name's spelled S H I T O L E. Oh, nice. So, um, and I had, it, I could hear a voice from right the back go, Shit hole. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to watch for that when I go and see yeah. it. No. Oh, yeah. Nice. I'll make reading the, sitting through the credits far more entertaining. <laughs> oh, Shit hole. <laughs> oh, it's Mr. Shit hole. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the, Honey the story... wagon driver. 
<laughs> nice. That the story for the film isn't anything we haven't seen before. Mm. But I just I thought it was done really well. It's I got the same level of enjoyment out of this yeah. as I got out of John Wick Two. Oh, okay. And I, I really enjoyed John Wick Two. Nice. Okay. Yeah, so I yeah, still haven't seen that fun, either. <laughs> good good fun action action movie for me. Nice. Oh, that's excellent. Um Okie dokie. Well, um Yeah, uh, as far as my week has gone, um yeah, I I really I, I can't really say anything because it will just bring the bloody mood down. So let me just say it's been a very, 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 very shit week. And to anyone out there who thinks I'm some kind of performing monkey, this is just just don't come up to me in the next forty eight hours to to tell me that you think some some meme that you've read about fucking Mass Effect Andromeda, you know, don't just don't don't try and poke the bear and think you're funny, because all that's going to happen right now is I'm going to throttle the life from you. That's this is and that if my lightest my lightest thing on my day and my week is that 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 kind of sets the tone because all I've had is cunts coming up to me going oh yes have you seen this meme have you seen these reviews have you seen this have you seen that it's like what do you want me to do do you want me to get cross do you want me to get angry do you want me to shout and scream or make some boo hoo noises because I ain't gonna do that I'm just going to ignore you. And if you keep doing it, I am actually going to end up fight, placing your body somewhere that they're never going to find you. Um, Yeah, because I ain't in the mood for shit like that at the moment, frankly. I've had a really, really, really bad weekend. And I didn't do much in the week. But this weekend just been fucking the worst. So... There you go. I haven't got much to say because if I say it, we'll just be sitting there going, oh, oh, all right then. <laughs> the mood will just go, the mood, not that it's, it's particularly up at the moment, but it will just go. <laughs> so just imagine a bad, 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 bad stuff and then just go, oh, that all happened. We don't need to hear about it. And <laughs> just know that going from that, my tolerance for people thinking that they're being funny to wind me up about something I've actually been looking forward to for five years is not going to be received very well. There you go. So, please, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, and the other thing is, um, Darren, The uh, just so you know, the black mic on, on the soundboard has exploded. So I'm now running off of your mic. <laughs> so we can't actually do Black Dog at my house anymore until I replace the second mic. <laughs> it, it exploded. <laughs> it went <laughs> it just went it was it was sounding quiet when we were recording um Space Dock. Yeah. And then I suddenly thought, oh, oh maybe this and there's Pete going, Oh, oh, it's uh, sounding a bit quiet and then Andy's going, Yeah, you sound a lot quieter than normal and I thought, Oh, what's that? And then I just sort of thought I'd reboot and I did a reboot and then I took the microphone and I went <sighs> testing testing blah 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 and all of a sudden it just went <laughs> and then that was the end of it <laughs> so so yeah so as far as actually recording this uh in the house i've only got one mic so that's good <sighs> there you go anyway right so um yeah those are the two lightest elements of my week so uh yeah um let's let's just just put a smile on our face, a spring in our step, and let's go and review Life Force. Okay, right, so Life Force. Force, the movie, is a 1985 science fiction horror film star, uh, directed by Tobe, or Toby Hooper, written by Dan O'Bannon, and based on the Colin Wilson 1976 novel The Space Vampires, starring Steve Railsback, Peter Firth, not Colin Firth, as I can t- 
continually said on on Twitter and Facebook while I was watching it. Uh, Frank Friendly, Matilda May, and Patrick Stewart. The film portrays the events that unfold after a trio of humanoids in a state of suspended animation are brought to Earth after being discovered by a crew of European space shuttle in the hold of the alien spaceship. The film received mixed reviews, uh, but was a box office bomb failing to recoup its budget. Well, let's talk about its budget. Um, It had a budget of $25 million. Uh, What did it make, Darren? Two grand. <laughs> okay. Elton. 17, I reckon. 17 what? Million. Oh, right. Okay. Not 17 pounds. Um, and Jim. 12 million. Ooh, look at him on the money there. 11, 11.6. I think that's close enough. Bingo, stingo to you, sir. Nice. Um, the, um, the, <laughs> the soundtrack was done by Henry Mancini, um, of all people. Uh, yeah, which is a bit odd. Um, Life Force was the first film of Toby Hooper's three-picture deal with Canon Films, following his enormous success with Poltergeist, which was a collaboration with Steven Spielberg. The other two were the remake of Invaders of, uh, from Mars and The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Filming began on February the 2nd, 1984, before Toby Hooper was finally approved. Michael Winner was offered the chance to direct the film. The movie was originally filmed and promoted under the same title as the Colin Wilson novel. Canon Films, which reportedly spent $25 million in hopes of creating a blockbuster movie, disliked the, f- the title Space Vampires for sounding too much like another of the studio's typical low-budget exploitation films. As a result, the title was changed to Life Force, referring to the spiritual energy the space vampires drain from their victims. It was edited for a US theatrical release by TriStar Columbia for into a 101-minute domestic cut and was partially rescored by Michael Kamen, with the majority of Henry Mancini's original music remaining. Although seldom recognised, Life Force is largely a remake of Hammer Films Quatermass and the Pit, or Five Million Years to Earth. In an interview, Toby... Ooh, debatable claim there. <laughs> yeah, apparently. Very debatable. <laughs> exactly. In an interview, Toby Hooper discussed how Canon Films gave him 25 million, free reign, and Wilson's book. Hooper then uh, shares how giddy he was and, quote, I thought I'd go back to my roots and make a 70mm Hammer horror film. The screenplay was written by Dan O'Bannon uh, and to- Don Jacoby, and Toby Hooper came up with the idea of using Haley's Comet in the screenplay rather than an asteroid belt as originally used in a novel, uh, as the comet was going past the Earth one year following the film's release. The f- time settings were also changed to the mid 21st century, from the mid 21st century to the present day. Colin Wilson was unhappy with the way the film turned out, and he wrote of it John Fowles once told me that the film that the film of The Magus was one of the worst films ever made. After seeing Life Force, I sent him a postcard telling him I'd gone one better. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, James Horner was asked to write the film score before Henry Mancini was brought in to produce a score consisting of 90 minutes and occasionally atonal ambient music using the London Symphony Orchestra. Um, blah, 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 editing and post-production, we don't really care about that. Um, reception. The movie received mixed reviews from critics. Uh, Michael Wilmington of New York Times said the movie was movie was such a peculiar movie that it's difficult to get a handle on it. Jay Carr wrote in the Boston Globe that it plays like a tap dancing zombie, and John Clute <laughs> dismissed Life Force as. <coughs> yeah, I know. It's just a quote. <laughs> uh, John Clute dismissed it as Life Force being a deeply silly flick. Leonard Mailton called it the called the film completely crazy and said it was ridiculous but so bizarre it's almost fascinating. On the other hand, uh, science fiction authority C. J. Henderson praised the film. Life Force is an incredible film and may be the most intelligent vampire movie ever ever made. The ideas presented in Life Force are beyond other vampire movies, beyond all of them, light years beyond. The story is what makes this movie really hum. The Life Force, Life Force is a true thinking sci-fi found film. While Andrew Milgore and John Strasick of in their Lurker in the Lobby um, review explained that Colin w- Wilson wrote that Space Vampires had a consequence of H.P. Lovecraft's publisher August Derleth, Derleth? Challenging Wilson, who was critical of Lovecraft's writing, to write a Lovecraftian novel himself. 
um, and continued, Life Force is a sp- big, splashy, and scenes of pop- apocalypse apocalyptic London are not to be missed and the film is an obvious tribute to Nigel Neal's Quatermass and has deep roots in the Lovecraftian mythos there you go so um, who hasn't seen this film before I hadn't hey Elton (laughs) (laughs) congratulations you win the I'm going first review time. Okay. Go right. on in. So what do you think of Life Force? Life Force. Well, I'm I'm going to come straight out and say it. Because I, I don't feel that there's a lot of depth that I can go into on this. Mm-hmm. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Up until a certain part. And then it just went, what? Okay. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, interesting turn of phrase. <laughs> yeah. <Motorboat> in. <laughs> yeah. Go <laughs> on. Can you guess what part? <laughs> I'll bet you can't. Um, plastic Patrick Stewart's head. Well done. Really? <laughs> yeah, it was oh, totally, yeah. Ding. Nice. <laughs> it was... It's not great, but I was having fun with it up until that point when they turned around and went, oh, it's vampires, and just assumed, oh, it's vampires. And I just went, what? (laughs) Vampires? Yeah. Where did this come from? Yeah. (laughs) Oh, oh, now there's blood coming out of Patrick Stewart and (laughs) and the guy on his bunk bed. Like, yep. What? What the? And oh, it's turning into a blood lady. Um. What? I don't. I don't see where this came from. What it means or how it works. <laughs> what the fuck. <laughs> Up until that point, I was having a grand old time. Were, I thought. Were you? <laughs> I was. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I was. <laughs> One hand on the keyboard. <laughs> 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 no, it was. I, I, it was, I don't know, it, I was having fun with it. I thought their journey into the, the comet was acceptable. I thought that looked quite nice. I thought the idea of a an organic ship was all right. And then being in ice cubes or something weird, weird old things that I didn't understand, but... Mm. It kind of worked in my head for no reason whatsoever, <laughs> other than I was going along with it. Yeah. I thought, do you know what? Yeah, okay, I can dig this. Then people started losing moisture out of their bodies and then regaining moisture in their bodies. And I thought the <laughs> the, the puppets that they used were quite fun, actually. Um, I had fun with it until... That body sat up on that desk on on the the, the autopsy table. Mm-hmm. That first one where he opened his eyes. Oh my god, I laughed so hard. Um, <laughs> but then he, the way he just abruptly sat up. Now, yeah. I'm I'm not dehydrated like that guy was. No, and yet I struggle to sit up the way that he did there. <laughs> without using his arms and going, oh, do you know what? Oh, there we go. I'm up. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm 38. I make them noises. I don't know why I make them noises, but I still make them noises when I stand up. I still go, oh. Everyone <laughs> see, does. See, he was a man of 20s, what they said on the autopsy. That's the reason why. Ah, oh, okay. It's 30. Wait. 30 is the age where it's the law. You have to make a noise when you sit down or stand up. <laughs> yeah. It's official. You get given a card and everything. <laughs> you get t- you get sent to you get sent to um an actual place where they do lessons and everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, but yeah. That chap, he didn't make a noise and if his body can I don't know how he didn't rock backwards and legs straight up in the air, going, oh, my God. (laughs) Um, But I just had fun with it up until the point where blood started coming out of Patrick Stewart's mouth for no discernible reason. Yeah. And it just went, 
what vampires are okay and we all know what how i feel about vampires and it just lost me at that point i didn't give a shit about it it just no nope, i've had enough now please please just go away yeah um but i i like the mystery behind it the the late the naked lady well i like the naked lady but i like the the way the naked lady walked through the the offices trying to get out of the, the building that she was brought back into there, there's so many things that you just go why would you do that what are you doing <laughs> to what which the fuck is going on to which i have to refer you to page one book one of the black dog podcast um bible which says and i quote shut up that's why <laughs> 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 so uh yeah well, how long you had that under your hat for ah! <laughs> <laughs> um yeah it's mm. it was fun yeah there's certain bits where where one of the dehydrated guys or the, the bloke without the life balls or whatever the fuck you call it <laughs> i don't understand uh he ran at the the bars <laughs> and just turned into dust i thought that was brilliant <laughs> I thought that was a marvelous. Yeah. But once it once the word vampires was mentioned, it lost me. <laughs> so and I was <laughs> I was quite disappointed with it. And it it went on a bit too long. Sorry, Darren. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it it started to drag towards the end. Mm. Uh but I I have to hold my hands up. I was having fun up until that point. Right. Okay. I, I, I can't find anything to really latch on and really dive into. I just had a bit of fun. <laughs> okay. Cool. I, I, might, I might flash back later. I, I, I think you might. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. Okay. Um. Uh, I tell you what, Jim. I know you've seen this a number of times, so I'm, yes. what I might do is I might skip to Darren first. Okie dokie. Because then we can have a counterpoint. Because I, because <laughs> I get a sneaky suspicion if we let Darren go off on one, and then we can come back to you, then we can have a bit of balance. <laughs> 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 Don't ask me why. <laughs> I just suspect <clears throat> that maybe, just maybe, <laughs> that Darren might go off on one. I don't know why. <laughs> Am I wrong, Darren? Um, <coughs> uh, sort of. <laughs> Come on in. <laughs> sort of. Um, <coughs> this is not the worst thing I've ever seen mm. by a long shot. Mm. It's also not the best thing I've ever seen by a, also a very long shot. Yeah. Um, I don't know who it is that keeps coming up with these ideas that that Britain's got its own space fucking <laughs> society going on somewhere. Yeah. I mean, you know, fucking hell, we could just about build fireworks correctly in this country. You know, it's, <laughs> you want you want us to build a fucking space shuttle as well? Mm. You know? Um, and get Hazel and to fly it. <laughs> it get Hazel to fly it, yes, indeed. I, I wondered if there was anybody else who'd spot that. Uh, <laughs> The detective <laughs> from the fucking seventies stroke eighties, yeah. Hazel. Yeah, um, the Churchill was a cooler looking shuttle, though. The problem was every time anyone said Churchill, are you there? I kept waiting for someone to come over the headphones and go, "Oh yes." <laughs> <laughs> oh no! <laughs> Did anyone spot the Bowie reference? <laughs> no. <laughs> when it's returning at Mission Control, they say the circuit's dead. They can't hear us. Oh my god. <laughs> Oh, right, I thought right, you were going right. to tell me that the, the guy who was piloting the thing's uh, name was Tom. Um, <laughs> anyway, go on, carry on down. Um, so what I want to know is, <laughs> how did two extra fins on the front of a fucking space shuttle make it a deep space space shuttle? <laughs> yeah, because right. cause solar panels work really well the further away from the sun you get. Uh, no, it's, it's got two tiny little fins, right, <laughs> on the front of it. Because if you look at that, then they send the Columbia up to rescue it. That hasn't got little fins on the front of it. So obviously, that's not a deep space space shell. No. Nah. <laughs> so how how do the extra fins make a difference in deep space where there's no fucking air? I, that's what I want to know. 
do I have to go back to it again? <laughs> <laughs> just watch it. There we go, quickly. quickly. Oh. Lee, Lee, just keep your finger in that page. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> Shut up. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> also, if you're going to set your high security <laughs> space agency up in a fucking 70s office block, <laughs> television what do you expect? Seriously. <laughs> right, you set them up. It. You put the bodies in the fucking stationary cupboard. What, 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 what would you expect? You, they're going to escape. See, I, I expect that exactly from a real British space administration. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was spot on for how we do things, frankly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've got the bodies in the fucking stationary cupboard, and we've got the artifacts in the broom cupboard. <laughs> yeah, don't don't worry, don't worry. This this really badly sealed glass partition will protect us against any biological hazards that there may be. <laughs> oh, man. While wearing a, while wearing a welder's mask and a Hoover attachment. <laughs> oh, and another thing: screen your fucking security staff. Okay, cool. Blimey, Make sure there's nobody with like who's on a sex offenders register. <laughs> actually. Well, no, actually, for you. From my experience in the 80s of working with security guards on night shifts, I think that is how they recruited them. <laughs> 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 Frankly. Oh, dear. Oh, let's, let's look through the six offenders registered to see who the likely candidates are for this job. Oh, blimey, she ain't got no clothes on. She's walking yeah. around in the buff, ain't she? <laughs> You know what? I, one of my favourite bits on that is when the security guard is trying to tempt her down with a fucking rich tea biscuit. <laughs> He's standing there he's like, "Come on, love, there you go. Look, look, it's a, it's a rich tea. It's an knob. Don't say that. Tell her it's a fucking knob. He looks classy. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, it's a chocolate covered knob. Yeah, that's it, Bill. That's yeah. it. Yeah, that, that'll that. do that's it. That's the British way. Say it. <laughs> yeah, no. yeah. This is this is one of the Foxy's ones. Not any of those McVitie's shit. <laughs> I've paid money for this. Just. <laughs> oh. Yeah. I Go. mean, you know, I'll I'll give it its due. Some of the special effects weren't extremely terrible. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't they weren't utterly shit they were just well, shit it's like, no it's like when they were in space and they were going up well that's another oh, thing as no. well when the when the fuck was did, did Haley's comet turn pee fucking green the fuck was that all about I'll tell you what well, um, well uh, you've got uh, uh, Lucas Films are a, a bit busy this week so I'll tell you what we'll do is we'll get the we'll get the visual effects director from the top of the fucking pops in right to colour Haley fucking Comet right oh. we'll have him, like, that, it, that picture of the lights somebody's somebody's playing with the dimmer switch you know that guy who invented that fucking manoeuvre and then we'll make it look a bit negative um yeah, since since when was Haley's comic green? <coughs> what was that all about? Was it a bit ill? Is that what it was? Shut up! That's why. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never going to tire of that. Oh God! Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Stuff. <laughs> um, I'm I'm glad to see that they had. <laughs> Uh, the go-to person for um, handsome, insert job here, older bloke in there. Oh, yeah. was in just about everything during the 70s. I can't remember the guy's name. The guy with the, the white hair. Um, Frank Finlay. Frank Finlay. Frank Finlay, that's it. Yeah, yeah him. Him um, <laughs> playing handsome, older doctor with posh voice <laughs> who knows stuff. Yes. Knows yeah. those much more than any evidence is giving him. <laughs> Indeed. So um, we had, we had, um, we had uh, fucking Hazel, mm. the detective in there. Yep. We had the geezer from Bouquet of Barbed Wire in there, and possibly various scenes in Crossroads. <laughs> that, I mean, this is a real cornucopia of talent mm. they threw at this film. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or, or should it be the other way around? They threw the film at the talent. 
I think that's what. <laughs> you will be in this, you bastards. Take that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Michael Gothard, who was um, who was the constantly chain smoking um, was it head of head of European NASA, Birmingham. Um, yes. Who who was also in For Your Eyes Only. European oh, NASA, uh, Birmingham. Yeah. The, yeah. The, <laughs> that's what I look like. <laughs> The hero of the piece, <laughs> whose only other job he'll ever have was appearing as Dwayne Barry in the fucking X Files, as well. Oh, um, Steve Rail's back. Yeah, he's Dwayne Barry in the X Files. Now I've seen him somewhere else. I have seen him in something else. Is it a Nest Cafe advert by the <laughs> <laughs> with Gareth Hunt? <laughs> it, it, it's like it's like the British Expendables. It's, this would have been. Mm. Yeah, so you would have had Hazel, mm. Frank, a bloke from Bouquet of Barbed Wire. <laughs> I don't know what the character's name was, um, and and fucking Dwayne Barry or it, Gareth Hunt. They should have had Gareth Hunt in this. Yeah, well, they probably did. At least um, it would have given it a credence or like some semblance of of scientific fact. Yeah, um, with him. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm sorry. It's I've right. got a cold. It's all right, mate. It's fine. My sinuses are blocked, and it's stopping the oxygen from getting to my brain. <laughs> no, um, that's fine. It's all good, mate. It's all good. It kind of it kind of simulates the viewing uh, experience <laughs> of watching Life Force because <laughs> you you think you sit there think to yourself, it's like, am I having trouble breathing? <laughs> am I about to pass just, out? It's, am I, is this why I'm sitting there accepting what I'm seeing on screen? <laughs> because it's, there's a voice at the back of my head banging on, yeah. on the control room going, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, something like that. What's this shit? Yeah. Um, oh, dear. Right, okay then. Well, um, shall we move on for the moment then to uh, to, to Pete? I'm sorry, Pete. What am I talking hey. about? What? Okay. Wrong you, show. You know what it is? It's because I'm looking at IMDb and I've just looked at Peter Perth to remind myself not to say Colin Firth, and now I'm calling everyone Pete. I'm just having, to be on the safe side. Just to be on the safe side. <laughs> covers covers all <laughs> covers all bases. All right, Pete. You're right, Pete. Well, we finish with Pete. We'll move on to Pete from Pete. <laughs> anyway, Jim. Peterborough. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Jim. So, go on then. What did you think of it, sir? Uh well, I'll, let me give me my sort of history with Life Force. Um, I remember kind of uh, some friends of mine went to see it at the cinema and came back raving about it. Mm-hmm. And it, um, <laughs> I think it was, it was, it was only you know looking to me out for a week and then vanished. And I, I don't think I got to see it at the cinema, but I caught it as soon as I could on the video. Mm-hmm. Um, and I watched it and. Now I am. I hadn't read the book at the time, but I am yeah. quite a, a, a what's the word? Uh, an infatuado. An, uh, no, I can't say the word. A fan yeah. of, <laughs> of Colin Wilson. Yeah. Um, really, he's written some brilliant, brilliant books on a variety of different subjects. He's a very erudite man, um, and he has he's written crime fiction. So he has written some SF and some Cthulhu mm. mythos fiction. Yeah. Um and I think it's been my book he's written one of the one of the best books on serial killers and you know what makes them tick. Oh yeah. Um and I also, also recommend uh, he did a book called Star Seekers about the history of um astronomy. Okay. Which is really good. Mm. Full of lots of interesting things. Um mm. uh, uh really fascinating. He, he he's a very he's a, a very erudite man but very readable. That mm. was his gift. Yeah. Um I watched Life Force. And I thought, like, I bet he wasn't happy with this. Because <laughs> <laughs> when, yep. when he was writing in the seventies, the kind of SF he was writing was very much like new wave sci-fi. Yeah, where it's about you know inner space and ideas and politics and uh, I mean a lot a lot of his books you know do tend to be a vehicle for his you say, a philosophical kind of you know ideas and mm. you know the very sort of fact heavy. <laughs> Yeah, and it was a quite a few you know years before I actually you know managed to you know get a copy of the book and read it and go yep they, this is kind of a Bond style adaptation yeah 
you take the title, <laughs> yeah. you, take, you take the names of the characters, you take a basic premise, and then you go and do something entirely different that is largely a string of set pieces <laughs> strung together. <laughs> yeah, you just go wibble and then just wander yeah. off. Yeah. Uh, now, for, first of all, sir, I enjoyed a lot of the um, the kind of big set piece effects, mm. but I didn't think, like, this is this is a mental movie. I was sort of very much bemused by it. Um, yeah. And um, I didn't see it for years, but then in kind of the early days of the internet, I started, you know, going, you know, as you do, and right at the start, you're looking, you know, very primitive site, fan sites, and there's a British horror movie site. Mm. And they had a long review of Life Force, and lots of people chatting, I saw that, that was mental. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I went back and saw it again, and kind of, and, yeah. and it's kind of thought, actually, this is a terrible film, but there's something about it I like. <laughs> um, uh, now why I own it on Arrow Blu-ray uh, right okay <laughs> I mean it's not a film I watch a lot but it's one I have kind of an affection for because it's kind of for me it's kind of like it's like going on a roller you know they often say a film's like a roller coaster ride yeah but in the case of Life Force this is like going on a roller coaster ride at one of those dodgy fairgrounds that turns up on like a common outside of town. <laughs> and, um, you know, you go on it and you start getting a bit nervous when you realize, you know, the, the ride operator may have been in prison as recently as that morning. <laughs> <laughs> and the girl on the hot dog stand has fresh stitches in her head. Uh, yeah. And it sets off and starts going, you go, oh, this might not be quite bad. And then it starts lurching abruptly and you actually think, God, I actually might die. <laughs> kind yeah. of, that's kind of like life was he's like for me mm. um for me it kind of it's if you want to put it on a scale i would say it's kind of if it took one step to the left it would be reanimator if you take one step to the right you're the keep Ooh, and dear. life force is on that line between them maybe, maybe we should do the keep it keeps worth doing, dear me. It's on Netflix. Um, I've not seen the keep for years, but that's a bonkers <laughs> film. I mean, I mean, as I've got older, I found kind of we often say on this, you know, the worst things a film can do is bore you. Yeah. And Life Force just lurches so bizarrely. Yeah. But having sort of with more like hindsight this time watching it, it's kind of I I think kind of a lot of people don't have the right end of the stick about this film. Because okay. if you look at the other two films Tobe Hooper did for a canon, yeah. they're both kind of black comedies and satires. And think I think that's what he's definitely doing in this. He's going, I've got a film. They want me to make this. They want a naked lady running around. Right, who cares? <laughs> Let's yeah. have a laugh. And that's the spirit I approach it in. I mean, actually, for me, I think I have a, I have a similar point where every time I watch it, is the point it goes off the rails. Right. And that, that's a cunning pun. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> because every time I watch Life Force, I sit down, and the, the first act, I think, this is really good. There's John, a uh, nice space effects by John um, Dyskara. Dykstra. And, that's it, yeah. Sorry. And, um, <laughs> yeah. and it's, you know, it's unfolding nicely, and it's all fine, and then you have the cuss coming to life, which is hysterical. Um, <laughs> I yeah. love I love them so much. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, just you know, yeah. great fun, great. Yeah. Fun. But the moment it goes off the rails mm. is when fucking Steve Railsback comes back from space. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's when the film sort of just. And it is, it, I blame Railsback for this because he's appalling. Yeah. I mean, I think if the rest of the film, if you just had Frank Finlay and Peter Firth as a steed and gambit style mm. yeah. <laughs> adventures, you know, bearing, <coughs> you know, running around investigating. It'd be so yeah. much better. Where it's kind of those flashbacks kill the pace and rails back. I think a better actor could sell you on some of this kind of um, psychic link business. But as it is, you just come with going, God, Matilda has got awful taste in women, in men. He's a tool, isn't he? <laughs> You know, he kind of he just looks like a man who's just got back from jogging, and that's kind of his performance of being sweaty and a bit out of breath. Yeah, and it just doesn't work. It's awful. I hate him. <laughs> <laughs> and kind of, but for me, kind of when the the point where Elton 
got lost in the helicopter where it just goes for the crazy again. That's where it picks up again. It's kind of <laughs> for me, you know, just because that way it's gone totally bonkers. Yeah. And um, I mean, I, I got the Arrow DV uh, Blu-ray because it does have the European cut, which is the original long cut. And this is a typical Canon films move. Mm. We've got a film that's too long. We want it more conventional length. Do we A, take out the talky bit in the middle, mm. or do we B, treat it like a bit of two by four and just chop a bit off the end, which <laughs> involves buses blowing up, lots more zombies and husks, Colonel Kane fighting his way across London. Actually, stuff that costs money and is exciting. Yeah. No, we'll put that out and trim it off so the film ends really quick. <laughs> you fucking dickheads. <laughs> I mean, it's missing the best line in the movie. Mm. There's a whole bit of when they return to London, they actually go to a military base. Mm. And um, Kane commandeers a car and a weapon. And yeah. He's driving out the base and he flashes with it. Colonel Kane. I'm going across the bridge. And the soldier goes, ooh, you don't want to go in there, sir. And Pete the Verdes looks at him and goes, yes, I know. Oh. <laughs> Which wins 1985's Sarcasm Prize. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> it's not in the theatrical. It's like, you fucking twats. <laughs> but yeah, it's, a, it's, mm. it's one of those, it's not a good film, but it's a film I enjoy. Mm. Uh, I enjoy moments of it rather than the thing as a whole. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to do my own cut of it <laughs> and get it, down to, get it down to an hour and a half and just trim back, cut out steel rails back. That's what I'd do, frankly. <laughs> you can go more or less. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> okay. Well, um, you, you, you okay, sir? Is that it? Or shall I move? Uh, I'll, I'll leave that there. Leave it there. Okay, <laughs> fine. Okay. <laughs> Well, I, I watched it. I watched it a couple of days ago, um, and I jumped on Twitter because I, I was I was about thirty seconds in, and I thought me and this film aren't going to get on. We're just not. Just no, no, no. And so I started tweeting, and then I found myself because I was tweeting and because I was finding myself going, "Oh my god, everything about this is fucking appalling." I, I. I literally found myself having to sort of stop, laugh, giggle to myself, make some notes, and then go, oh, best I tweet that bit. <laughs> I almost watched the film in, like, staccato. So then I had to watch it again a couple of days ago. <laughs> I'm like, I mean, it didn't get any better. But I, I love, the dialogue is just gloriously inept. It's just like... There is so much. Another one of my favourite lines so I just got flashing back. Mm. Where they find the woman in the park. Yeah. Peter Fur turns to Frank Frill and goes, You know what this means? Yeah. She's got clothes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. She's got clothes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like, <laughs> wow. Oh, just, just well done. Just <laughs> fantastic work there. <laughs> kids, kids following her as well. Yeah. Well, wait. wait. We followed them, you know, because we thought we, we might, might see something. something. Yeah, and the it, thing is, that whole sequence—that's like I'm sure that's Toby Hooper doing a homage to the Confessions of a Winter Cleaner series. <laughs> well, half the bloody cast sound like they just—they're jobbing it from off on the fucking buses. I mean, he's like, "God blimey, look, she's got no clothes on." What? I never. And I mean, there's this just like, like hold on, I've I've written it down here. Hold on, here we go, Colonel Kane. You mean there's life after death? Frank Finley. Yes. Is there? What? Life after death. Do you really want to know? No. Well, to answer your question, yes. It's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm having an nasty flashback. <laughs> Go on. I'm having an nasty flashback. Okay, so picture the scene in the film. It's getting near the end of it. There are people running around, tearing each other limb from limb. Okay. And you've got, they turn up at the prime minister's place. Right. Mm. And it's like the secretary goes, I'll go and get him. Would you yeah. like a cup of tea? It's like, <laughs> cup of fucking tea? I want a fucking pint of gin. That's what I fucking want. If you want to just look out the window, love, you'll see that it's the apocalypse is going on out there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I just, I just love. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my Twitter now because I just, I have to go through it again. 
But <laughs> it's like, it's just like, no one, no one seems to notice. It's like, everyone's standing there going, oh no, and we've got another one who's infected. And then there's a general standing there mopping his brow, looking like death. And they go, hmm, come on, general, let's have a conversation. And he's like, what, you, you can't tell right now? Really? I mean, everything about this film is just, you, I just spat pretty much the words what the fuck almost in a constant stream like a weird mantra as I was watching it. I I mean, everything from... <laughs> sorry, I'm just looking at my Twitter. Everything from Peter Firth, Peter Firth hiding behind a traffic pole in the middle of a zombie apocalypse and everyone's not seeing him <laughs> <clears throat> to the fact that, you know... Colin, F- uh, sorry, I keep saying Colin Firth because that's what I wrote on the bloody Twitter. But Peter Firth standing there, and it's like two seconds of standing there in Frank Finley's presence, and it's like he's a wrong un. He's totally a wrong un. You can tell. And it's like now we're going to have a conversation. It's like, are you, uh, a, are you, have you been infected? Oh yes, oh yes, I have. Steps dramatically out into the sh- out of the shadows. It's like, right, I hadn't figured that out. You know. Or the um, or the or the fucking the the zombie effects. Oh, just one reaches through a through a window when they're doing the truck. One reaches through a window, and when he reaches through the window and he's got to do like an attack of steel, Steve Ray, rails back. It's clearly a man's arm with some grey paint drawn all over it. <laughs> and then when it come, the zombie comes off. They sort of switch it for an actual prop, which is which has lost about seventy two stone off of that arm. <laughs> <laughs> it's just what, and then it's just like things things just come left out left field. Like why has Frank Finley suddenly got a spike, a, a skewer to kill vampires? Where did that come from? How did he know? eBay. <laughs> <laughs> fucking see he did it as well he forgot about his amazon purchase <laughs> he, he went out there he got one he's got a, he's got a, a fancy dress party he's going to mm. he's going as he-man mm. he's ordered the the fucking mm. the sword of gray skull yeah and it's turned up just yeah. when he needs it most yeah i mean i mean i knew i was on the wrong and the instant it came up dan o'bannon and within 10 seconds there's a bunch of astronauts going onto an organic spaceship, finding something in the cargo hold. It was like, yep. yeah, hey, Dan. Uh, you want- in fairness, though, that is in the novel in 76. Ah, well, then in which case, poor old Dan got, got badly lambasted for no reason in my house, because I was just mm. like, oh, fuck off, mate. You've only got one, you've got uh, one idea. Yeah, you know, even the spaceship is described as being a... Um, like a gothic cathedral. <laughs> it's, um... it's kind of actually, it's kind of. Mm. Mm, hang on. I'm afraid Uncle Ridley stole an awful lot more than people realise, you know. Yes. Yeah, from the book, maybe, but not from the not from this. Jesus. Oh, not from this, no, but you know, it's kind of. You should get yeah. your dominoes in order of who stole what from where and when. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, there is a bit stolen from Bram Stoker's Dracula in this as well. Oh, yeah. And that's the fact that the space shuttle comes back. And there's nobody on board it, which is like the ship that lands at Whitby. Yeah, yeah. it's also uh, the first Quater Mass as well. Yeah, yes. I was going to say that was that. Yeah, the first Quater Mass. Mm. Um, the, the other thing is, it's like what made me laugh, and this is going to sound weird because we talk, you know, talking about the lady, lady with her boobies floating about and everything on display. Nudie lady, nudie lady. It was quite funny to see how incredibly hard pardon the pun the the and to what lengths the film went to hide the nude blokes it yes. was really <laughs> funny right down to sort of like putting them and angling the glass of the windows so that a str- like a streak of a streak of light would actually cover just the only bit it would cover would be their cocks and then <laughs> and then it was just like um Ah, oh, Austin Powers. It was. It was. It got to especially when they wait when the two male vampires wake up and they walk along and it's like they walk just uh, just just slightly above cock height is is a telephone and and then <laughs> new imperial measurement there. <laughs> cock height, yeah. And, and it's the like, vase as yeah, well. There was a vase. Gel, something like That's that. right. Then the then the glass windows smashed and then it was like all the broken glass has shattered into sort of like frosted glass for some reason. And then they were walking through the frosted glass and it was like what? 
So so we've seen so we've seen Lady Lady Vampire with you know the full nine yards and 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 then some plus change flopping about all over the place. These two guys get up and it's like, oh no, we cannot show this. And it's like, and it just what? In fairness, though, that's not the filmmakers. That is the censors at the time. Oh. <laughs> if you wanted your film to be shown outside private clubs or not, <laughs> it's just. It's just insane. It's just like, you know, we've talk, we're talking about all sorts of weird stuff. We're seeing blood, guts, lady baps, every, everything. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, the men vampires are walking along and it is literally an Austin Powers sketch for like 10 minutes until they all blow up. And it's like, and, and some of the dialogue from the men vampires as well, it's like, this would be a lot less terrifying if you just came to me. It's like, Really? Oh, okay. <laughs> what exactly are you doing on the steps of uh, surrounded by a thousand corpses? Mm, I wonder how this could be less terrifying. It's like, oh god. And Frank Finley, he just was like, he was like a, the like the script version of of one of those fruit machines where you sort of like you pull and you just get nothing but tokens out. It was like every time he turned up, they just go, Doctor, what's his name? And he go. Yes, uh, these must be vampires who have taken over the bodies and are showing us everything we want to see. Hmm. <laughs> and it's like, how, 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 how did you know this? How, how did you come about this this fantastic piece of information? And it's like, oh, they must have come from thousands of miles away. She's totally dangerous, and she's asleep. She's not doing anything. It's like. They, you know, oh, we can't, we can't know what's going on up there, but we have to assume the worst. And this, yeah, obvious man is obvious. <laughs> <laughs> it just every word out of his mouth was literally explaining something that the writers couldn't be bothered to actually show you. <laughs> he just, just he must obviously be desiccating and sucking the life force from everyone, R- right? Right, you how how did you come to this conclusion? And and then when it then when it needs to be, he's a complete idiot. Oh, don't worry, a naked girl's not going to get out of this complex. Right, okay, <laughs> we've got desiccated corpses littering littering BBC television house and <laughs> t- television centre. <laughs> we've got three of the most inept security guards known to man. Oh no no, no one's going to escape that. And then, this, and then it cuts to these two guards who look like they were jobbing on under buses going, Go, oh, blimey, did you hear that report? They said there's going to be a naked lady wandering around the building. <laughs> oh, you never believed that. I can't believe that. It's like, you're a security guard who'd been part of this fucking project. <laughs> would you not know this? He's also the man who tried to use a biscuit as a bargaining tool as well. So, you know... <laughs> Fuck it all. Oh man, I oh this film I mean, at one point it's a vampire movie. Another point is like some kind of weird psychosexual thing. And then you know, and then it's then it's confessions of a window cleaner, especially when the lady can change her shape and then she just keeps wandering up to dodgy old blokes who are changing tires in the middle of like fields. <laughs> and then then we get some sal- salacious kind of oh, you know, the music going as he slides his hand up her skirt and she just looks at him meaningfully and the next thing you know you get a report going yes we found him he's been missing for an hour for two hours but um yes he looks exhausted my baby fucking does but one thing we noticed <laughs> we couldn't get the smile off his face for four hours yeah or the coffin lid down <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we're now using his corpse as a deep planter for bulbs. <laughs> look, look, I can hang a towel off it. It's a bit like Baccarat. Put another towel on it. Go on, let's see how many towels can we. What, how many towels do you think we could get on there? Six, put, Bob, put, Bob, put, seven. Put, John, nine. Okay, come on then. Let's do this. We're playing quits with the corpse. Yeah. Put some tin foil on the end. He'll make a great compass if you threw him in the pool. <laughs> Stick him on the roof. We could use him as a lightning conductor. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh dear. Oh, <laughs> and I just yeah. And it just even so, even some of the things where clearly they didn't see the special effects. So the writers have written something. The special effects team are clearly working on something entirely different. And you get scenes like Colin Fur, uh, Peter Fur, sorry, looking out just of a, call him Colin. Yeah, Colin. Yeah, Peter Firth looking out of a window across the London skyline with Steve Rails back, and they're going. He's and Steve Rails back goes. She's drawing energy down towards her, and. Then Colin, Peter Firth goes, where? And then it cuts. <laughs> it cuts to <laughs> fucking St. Paul's Cathedral and a brilliant blue light coming straight down from top to bottom against the black sky. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> what? Did you notice that as well? The geography. Uh, the fucking... The terrible geography. In yeah. this. It, you, you get to the end. Apparently, if you walk to the very end of Tower Bridge... You get to St. Paul's Cathedral, which is right there. Yeah. <laughs> and the I, Tower of London's on the other end, of course. Yeah, exactly. It's, it, yeah, it's the only place. It's the only place on earth where the Thames Television logo looks exactly like the city. It's like Google Maps. Oh God, look it up, kids. Um, yeah, but it, just stuff like that. It was like, yes, yeah, she's drawing the she's drawing the souls up to the spaceship. And it's like, where? That bright fucking blue beam, you dick. <laughs> She's drawing our souls. Our souls. <laughs> this is Mission Control England. Mission Control England. Here we are in Catford. I mean... <laughs> and I love the bit. When... when when What's his face? The the lead of the um, NASA. He, or English NASA. Uh, is sitting there and he's having this cigarette and he's got like these eight televisions in his room and he's one sort of focusing on the corpse of the lady and then it's kind of he's sitting there looking at it and then you see the security guard wandering in as you do that BBC News comes on and goes the comet has been seen it's almost here this comet has been known as Dark Star Death Star here's all the bad names we've come up for comets this is this could be this has been the harbinger of doom for Harold and several thousand other things. Every time this comet's ever appeared, horrible things have happened. But just sleep well, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Go outside and take in the sights. And it's like Fuck <laughs> The What? <laughs> Literally it's like Kenneth Kendall turning up on television and going we're doomed, we're doomed, we're doomed, we're doomed. <laughs> Sleep well, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, he's so transfixed with that, he hasn't noticed that one of the security guards has gone into a sub- hermetically sealed area and is now currently touching up a, a now suddenly alive female person from another planet who just happened to be sitting in the storeroom. It's like, what? Oh, God. Just uh, everything about this just just had me kind of going, what? Just, just, just why? <laughs> why? Why? Why are you doing this? <laughs> oh dear. Anyway, um, this is a colossally stupid film. Oh, it's, oh, and the um, yes, the uh, the the zombies, the desiccated zombies, who are only desiccated as long as they're not having a rampage in in London. Because if they're in London, then they're just extras from from the thriller video. Um, yeah. Oh, and the end. The end. Fucking stab her. Yeah, I'm going to stab her with this amazing spear of destiny, which no one's really explained where that's come from, but whatever. And throw old Peter Colin... Firth, Frith, whatever, throws it down this hole, and it's, and he's like, <laughs> he's like, he's like, just uh, Lieutenant Steve Rails back. What are you doing? It's like, what you can't tell? They're having a shag in the plinth. What are you doing? Take hold of this spear. Get rid of her. And then it's like they he stabs her. All of a sudden, all the the souls go flying off all over the place, and you get this blue screen effect of the two of them flying into space <laughs> and then suddenly the spaceship just goes 
oh, well, all done. And then floats <laughs> off again. <laughs> bye-bye. Bye-bye, I'm off. Done. <laughs> see, see, see you again in another 76 years, suckers. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to fly off again to my bright green Haley's Comet. <laughs> it's like, what? Oh, God. Oh, I think it's bright green. I think that's <laughs> some sort of ham-fisted nod to Day of the Triffids. <laughs> That's my right. theory on that. <laughs> <laughs> I love. I also love the fact that when the when they when the astronauts went on to the it's not really the space derelict from alien alien spaceship. And they also they they treat seeing twenty foot wide space vampire bats as as kind of like oh oh well. Never mind. Let's get a bag. <laughs> oh, this is new, isn't it? <laughs> it was... It's like Trevor and Simon turning up. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, well, look at that. Um, well, never mind. Let's go deeper into the ship. I'm sure this will be fine. It's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> In, like I say, this film just had me going, what? Pretty much all the way through it. <laughs> Mind you, in fairness, in Alien, we have John Hurt going, mm, big slimy alien egg with something moving in it. I know, I'll stick my head in it. That'll Absol- be fine. Absolutely. I, again. He obviously trained at the same place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. If anything starts moving and looks slimy, the last thing you do is stick your head in it. I mean, let's be honest. But yeah. <laughs> I, just, I, I just love the fact that, you know, it would be if you would take the alien example. It would be like all three of them walking into the derelict, and there being like not just one thing dead in a chair, clearly from a thousand years ago, but it would be like hundreds of them all standing around, just looking like they're waiting for a bus, and and everyone just go <laughs> and everyone just standing there going, "Oh, anyway, let's carry on into the ship. I'm sure we'll be fine." <laughs> what? Oh dear. Um. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Anyway, so um, yeah, that's my thoughts. I, I, I can't, I can't really coherently sum up how befuddled I was by the end of this film. <laughs> I think, I think befuddlement is definitely the the overarching emotion I came away from this film with. So, uh, uh, should we move on to the feedback? I mean, um, any, it, last any last flashbacks? Any last flashbacks? The one that the bit I no. really enjoyed that me laughing as a go on when when uh, <laughs> Peter Firth stabs the uh, the bouncer male vampire at the end and he turns into a bat. Oh, he <laughs> does this brilliant panto double take. <laughs> well, fucking hell! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was not expecting that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hmm, okay. You can see, the way it's played, you can see he was just ready to do a proper 80s one liner after he <laughs> staked it, and it turns into that. Oh, fuck you now. Stop with thunder there. Yeah. It was, it almost, it almost needed sort of a Looney Tunes esque cowbell sort of dog, 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 kind of noise as he kind of does his double check. Or as he, he stops for a minute, looks at the camera and goes, that's totally batty. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's what he was going to say, but he was just so shocked. He's like, fuck. <laughs> yeah. You're not going in any Belfry now. Oh, no. There wasn't any... There, there, did you know what that film needed? It needed more slide whistle. That's what it needed. <laughs> yeah. It needed more... Um, we needed Bernard Breslau in there. Fucking Kenneth Williams. Um, <laughs> uh, which is, I just, I actually, I, I get the impression this was actually carry on... Carry on the space, mm. and they renamed Barbara it Windsor. and they gave it to, yeah, Barbara Windsor as the space vampire, um, yeah, mm. uh, what's his yeah. name, um, Sid James, mm. as the uh, as the American astronaut, yeah, and yeah, the music just as you're flying over though that weird rock for no discernible reason as the titles play, you just need da 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 da. Do, do, do. <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> Every time it cuts to a different scene, you'd have a. <laughs> 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 to be honest, it wasn't far off that at some point. So it really wasn't. <laughs> it is almost like we're. I, I don't. I mean, Toby Hooper is a 
has a strange sense of humour, which, you, you know, if you've seen yeah. Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, which uh, Cannon weren't terribly pleased with because they mm. didn't really want the bizarre um, satire in American fast food, the Hoyd horror film. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it, I get the impression that you were always trying to do some kind of homage to lots and lots of different British things he'd enjoyed over the years and just ramped them all into one film. <laughs> Hey! hey. <laughs> oh dear. Right. All right then. Well, I think we'll move on to the feedback because I'm sure we'll get some flashbacks out of that. So, uh, yeah. Let's see what what comes out of that, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I the way that ends. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Right. So, um, yeah, let's move on to our feedback. Um, I, I almost want to do some more Carry On Doctors stuff. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I wish they would just momentarily play during my day. What, this? Oh, Elton's come Tuna to work. sandwich. <laughs> Elton's walking to work. Yay. Yeah, we're all going to work now. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> right, anyway, moving on. <laughs> My Save that for when we start working in Black Dog Towers. <laughs> That's it, yeah. Yeah, that's it. You, yeah, seventies. Look up the sort of post office tower when when it was still spinning and had BT hanging off it. <coughs> anyway, yeah. Um, right. Our first piece of feedback is from Gregory Madden, um, who is Mister Wharf on the good ship Black Dog, and he writes. It says Lee hitting the zoom button because my screen's decided to shut everything down to really tiny type. Anyway, um, he writes. Greetings, Lee, Darren, Jim, and Elton, and that nocturnal galactic nightmare, Mister Owl. <coughs> oh, Mister Owl's on the on the ball this week. Um, this week we put on our rose-coloured specs and travel back to 1985 to look at the movie Life Force. As I've stated before, I'm no big fan of vampire movies, and space vampires are not any better for me. But with this movie, I couldn't help but laugh at it. To me, the concept was just so far out that it was almost comical. Now, I will have to admit that I've never watched this show before, and after this, I don't think I'll ever watch it again. So where should I start? Well, I'm not going to knock the ropey special effects too hard, because it was 1985 after all. Yeah, yeah, I mean, why would you knock that? I mean, what with Back to the Future being out and costing 10 million less? Why would you knock that? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but Back to the Future doesn't need nearly enough special effects. I mean, <laughs> you just go to a small American town, it still looks like the 1950s and the mid-80s and save yourself a shit ton. <laughs> yeah, I know. I just... just I, he, he just played into another thing I was doing on, on on Facebook when I was looking up the, how much it was costing. Uh, I was just like, oh, my God. <laughs> this was, yeah, what was it? Brazil and... Uh, cocoon and weird science and and a view to a kill and um oh mad max that was the other one mad max beyond thunderdome oh and nightmare on elm street 2 freddy's revenge but anyway oh and friday the 13th part 5 but let's not mention that <laughs> <laughs> don't mention elm street 2 either dear god oh god no i don't mention elm, elm street anything to be honest and just, uh. oh fright night that was another one and Explorers, which was Turd, and uh, Legend, and Lady Hawk. Oh dear. Okay, maybe maybe I'm falling. F- <laughs> maybe I should just move on. <laughs> anyway, so uh, Gary, conti- uh, sorry, Gregory continues. So I figured, you know, looking at the show, I just make a short list of things that stuck out to me. Ooh, uh, misses. So here goes. <laughs> Number one, the knockoff space shuttle being high tech deep space craft. Now, I understand there is how we shall say cheaper ways to get around designing a spaceship, 
but adding an extra fin to the obvious model of a space shuttle and trying to pass it off as some super high-tech spaceship is a bit ridiculous. I'm sure they could come up with something a bit more original. Number two. I never thought I would complain about this in a movie, but could they at least let Matilda May wear some clothes for more than two or three scenes in the whole show? Now, my teenage inner self enjoyed it eh, immensely, but it was obvious they did this to hide a weak plot and get teenage boys onto the seats in the theatres. Number three, at the climax of the show, um, I was severely confused. When did the show become a zombie apocalypse? Did the vampires turn into zombies? Or did the director just get confused? As I watched the carnage in the streets of London unfold, I suddenly got a sneaking suspicion that they may have just used the footage of rush hour traffic in London. (laughs) Yeah, without so much screaming. Um... I'm not sure, but did but it did sure remind me of that. Also, I was watching this space vampire zombie whatever monsters chase our hero down the street. I could have sworn I saw a zombie Dumbledore chasing him. So, you're telling me that in the magical world of Harry Potter isn't even safe in this movie. I know that it made... Well, I know this was made way before Harry Potter, but that guy just like him in the latter movies. Okay, maybe this movie is affecting my mind. I can't be sure. At the last but not least, number four, or Oh dear, they dragged Patrick Stewart into this movie, didn't they? The poor guy didn't stand a chance. All right then, I'll just wrap it up here. As I said before, vampire shows are not my favourite, but this is eighties. This eighties piece of work was just comical enough to keep my interest. So until next week, I bid you a good day from the security station of the USS Black Dog. Cheers, Mister Wolf, Greg Madden. Thank you very much for that, Greg. Well, there you go. Um, yeah, we didn't really talk about Patrick Stewart too much in the movie, did we? Because he no. doesn't really do an awful lot in the movie. It did feel like he just turned up long enough to get stabbed with a number of needles and go, oh, I'm going to give you my sexy eyes. <laughs> Before being replaced by a, a shop dummy that was just spitting, pissing blood out of his eyes. But uh, there you go. Yeah. Patrick Stewart does turn up an awful lot in these little roles in mid '80s movies. Yeah, it's 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 kind of hard to get past the fact that after John Luke Picard, he's only be- and the internet, he suddenly became a whole heap cooler. But <laughs> but, 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 but before that, he was turning up in in crazy bonkers land in things like Dune and and Excalibur and this and and basically just going oh yes <laughs> i'm from rada <laughs> then losing in a ufc fight on the floor after being stabbed by a syringe <laughs> yeah. yeah no how much what he's <laughs> like he's like a cut rate World again cut rate brian blessed he's like we couldn't afford brian blessed and brian blessed would be far too fearsome in the role of someone being wrestled to the ground by steve railsbeck so we'll get patrick stewart and then stab him instead oh blessed wouldn't have uh, he, he wouldn't stand for that at all nah he would have eaten just... the entire place <laughs> he would have, would have come in and found him sort of like devouring all the staff but anyway well thank you Bless it on the floor. No, yeah. nobody wrestles me. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> so thanks very much for that, Greg. Um, let's move on. Um, so, Darren, who do you have next? Um, I have Steve Bob. Ah, Steve Bob. And what does Steve Bob have to say? Uh, Steve Bob says, "Hi, chap. Steve Bob here. Hello, Steve well, Bob here. Uh, obvious. Um, <laughs> I'll keep this feedback for Life Force short. As a child, <laughs> I remember seeing the trailers for Life Force and really wanted to watch it." but I was far too young to see it at the cinema. Eventually, my dad got a VHS copy of the film, and I finally got to see it. Um, I enjoyed the film. I liked uh, I liked it at the time, but I was also aware that it wasn't a great film. And there were a, f- a lot of issues, the same that has been true for this rewatch. I won't go into detail about the things that are wrong with it, as I'm sure most of it's been covered already. What I enjoy about Life Force is that it's ambitious, creative, and entertaining. I like the practical special effects, the sets, the way it was shot, the story, the acting and dialogue were good, but not a great deal. It loosely parallels Quatermass in the pit and has a Lovecraftian uh, elements with no real explanation of what space vampires are, where they come from and where they go. I suppose these days, modern big budget films have whole committees of writers and producers to iron out anything that might be controversial, risky or just out of or, or just out and out weird. 
Uh, but with that, I feel a lot of the modern blockbusters are put together uh, just to get the maximum return on the investment rather than take a chance and potentially making something creative and unique. This is a film that could genuinely benefit from a remake, but instead it seems Hollywood is too focused on remaking the films that were good in the first place. Thanks for the podcast, guys, uh, and get a Patreon set up so we can show some appreciation and help with the costs. Thanks, Steve Bob. <laughs> nice. Okay, well, no problem there, Steve. Bye bye. <laughs> we'll see what we can do there. Um, here's one I made earlier. <laughs> yeah, here's one I made earlier. Um, of, of, and yes, and despite what anyone might think, I didn't just write that bit and stick it at the bottom of his post. <laughs> no, honestly, honest gov, I didn't. Um, <laughs> thank you. Bit, it, it wasn't at all like that bit in the Alan Partridge Christmas special where he got asked about the Rover Vitess. <laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is a great car. <laughs> well, it's funny you should say that, Alan. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> what do you think of the Rover Vitez? Um, yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much for that, Steve. I mean, you, I think it could do with a reboot, a remake. Well, I mean, mm. the only thing I would say, the only thing I would say is it's been so long since the the original film and so many other astronauts go on to alien spaceships find things bring it back and chaos ensues has happened that i i think it would be very hard even if the film was done right to to not draw comparisons negative comparisons with uh, just about any other science fiction movie with monsters in it at all i mean i don't know what do you think jim do you think there would be a way of doing it or it's one of those. It would be hard too. I mean, mm. I think kind of there's enough interesting ideas to play with to take it in a very different direction, mm. rather than just the usual, essential. Um, and then there were none run around where people get bumped off one by one. Yeah. Um, but I think that would be your first act would be trick. It would be a tough sell. Yes. Without appearing cliched. Yeah. That that is the that is the problem. It is it relies so heavily on so many tropes that have been rehashed in many different ways that it's just like by now I think a remake would 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 just you know fall foul of people going oh we've seen it all before you know very um, John Carter reaction I think mm. where everyone just goes been there done that seen this why are we watching it again in new clothing. But you know, I mean, have you you've read the book though? You said you read the book. I mean, yes, would, yeah. Would it be better just to straight up adapt the book, or well, it's one of the the, the book is it's very it's that seventies very cerebral SF. Mm. I, I'm not sure a movie would be the right way to go with it. Mm. I think I think it might play out better as a TV series if you went to sort of do the book more faithfully. Right. Um, whereas for actually a movie, you want to rework Life Force, mm. which is almost <laughs> a different thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause it's, it's quite far from what the book's doing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think they say the, the book would work, probably you know, work, work better as a TV series. It's, it's, it's smaller. It's mm. sort of smaller scale and more, yeah, more thinky and talky. Okay, so okay, I was yeah, I was just I was just in, intrigued. So I haven't actually read the, read the actual um. Oh my brain! I haven't actually read the book. So just whether or not it, I mean, because I'm just thinking of things like under the skin and that kind of thing nowadays. It's just whether or not you know whether or not with films like that floating about, whether or not you could just do a book adaptation or. But you know, I, don't... The, I think it's a, I think it's a tough kind of book to adapt anyway because it was written. You see, Alan Moore, it was written to be a book, and mm. it, like, there's a, you know, it's not just that, but it's is that the whole raft of those sort of seventies new wave SF novels that I don't think really work to yeah. be on the screen because they're so about internal things and discussions and mm. they don't make for riveting viewing. They make for good, interesting reading. Yeah. But to 
to actually bring that to life kind of in anything other than say like an art house film or a radio four drama serial <laughs> yeah you know what i mean it's, it's not gonna work yeah fair enough okie dokie well anyway thank you very much steve bob um yes i'm sure the if there's a patreon uh, we will be sure to let you know um uh, just just watch this space and any you know if it happens any donations all gratefully received but we'll uh talk about that once it once if and when it turns up um brilliant well thank you very much and uh yeah let's move on uh so uh jim who do you have first uh next we have dr scum himself ah fred love now uh, what's what's this thing? Lovecraftian Science dot WordPress dot com. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Got one for me and my uh, memory. Still can't work out Colin Firth and Peter Firth, but there you go. I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> we review this film a few more times. We'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, Fred Price. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Black Dog Crew. Hope all is well. Mm-hmm. Saw Life Force once in college on VHS more than thirty years ago. It was a fun movie to watch with a bunch of people drinking some beer and giving it the Mystery Science 3000 treatment. However, I've not seen it since then, so this is mm. a second viewing for me. As I mentioned on the Facebook page, this movie reminds me of a B-movie from the 1950s. It's as if a film crew from the 1950s was dropped into the 1980s and commanded to make a movie. I can imagine some of that film crew's comments. What, we can now show boobies on a film without getting into trouble? Okay. <laughs> what cool special effects you have now in the 80s? Let's use them all. Yay! <laughs> While the story itself is interesting, the scripts info- unfolds as if it was written by a hypersexual high school student who wanted to write a Quatermass tale. Even though there are two male vampires and one female vampire, the story was absolutely obsessed with the female to the point where the film felt a little too misogynistic for me. In addition, I think if the Ghostbusters were in London at this time, this would have all been straightened out within minutes. <laughs> Although then, we would not have had that batshit crazy ending. Mm. Also, was it me or did the male vampire at the end of the movie have the voice of Sir Christopher Lee? <laughs> One last point, I did love the bat creature at the end. Wanted a little more of that. Overall, a silly fun B-movie that is worth a watch once if you enjoy these kind of films, and I must admit I do. However, I prefer to watch a Quatermass movie over this one. Mm. There is an interesting Lovecraftian connection with this film. Life Force is based on the novel The Space Vampires, written by Colin Wilson. In some of his writings, Wilson criticised Lovecraft's tale as us being sick and having a war with rationality. These comments offended August Derleth, one of the founders of Arkham House Publishing, who threw a challenge to Wilson to write his own Lovecraftian tales. Mm. Wilson took up the challenge and wrote The Mind Parasites and some other Cthulhu Mythos tales. The Mind Parasites was actually published by Arkham House and is a pretty good Lovecraftian slash Cthulhu Mythos tale. Mm. Thank you, Black Dog, and looking forward to next week's film. Fred, Dr. Scum, love no. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for that, Dr. Scum. Yeah, this is this film's doing better than I actually um, anticipated. To be honest, I thought I thought it was going to get a proper kick in all the way through, but um, no. Well, there you go. Um, yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much for that, sir. Yes, uh, I, I would add to that. It's kind of um, mm-hmm. for me. There's a uh, on the Colin Wilson Cthulhu Mythos stuff. There's also the novel that the, the uh, Philosopher's Stone. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for me, my favourite of the ones he wrote that I think got really got closest to sort of the Lovecraftian vibe and had some very interesting, disturbing things in it is a short novella called uh, Return of the Loigar, mm-hmm. which is in uh, the Tales for the Cthulhu Mythos anthologies from Arkham House. There we go. Yeah. Mm. Essentially, they are a form of like evil mental mind parasites who, when they manifest, they turn up as big, slimy, sort of dragonish creatures. But mainly, yeah. they ta- they're taking pe- they take people over and they you then uh, not possess them, but they encourage degeneracy. <laughs> yeah, they're in the uh, 2000 AD series Zenith. Yeah, I was that's right. Yes, they're the big yeah. bad in that the mm. many angled ones they call them. Yeah. Oh, there you go. And and if you haven't read Zenith, uh, uh, Doctor Scum, Fred, do do check it out because it's a superhero oh, God, yes. film. It's a superhero series with uh, heavy heavy Lovecraftian influences, especially the first step, mm. first series. Uh, the the second one really takes it to town, and it really oh yeah, the, 
is it phase? Well, actually, it's phase, phase three. three is the one that you does it. Three. Yes, that's right. Mm. Yeah, it goes, that's when you need the happy pills. Yeah, when it all goes a bit wonky on multiple Earths. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> anyway, well, thank you very much for that, uh, Fred. And again, if you like Fred's writing, you like what he's got to say, then do check out his blog, which is LovecraftianScience.wordpress.com. Right, Elton. Over to you, sir. Who okay, do, who do we I have? have uh, Doreen Kelly. Ah, Keldor. Keldor. <laughs> okay, uh, and what does Keldor have to say? Uh, she says, hi. <clears throat> this wasn't quite as bad as the Facebook header picture made me think it might be. <laughs> I was shouting euphemism throughout, though. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so was I. <laughs> um, the astronauts weren't very clever. They said... Deploying sample bag mm. and then proceeded to use a net. <laughs> <laughs> a daft net that wouldn't even catch a fish. So, <laughs> so very far from a bag and definitely not a sample bag. Mm. I it was quite nice to see the British flags as well as the stars and stripes. I wonder if Cole Hurley will manage to hold off mentioning how many years before his birth this was made. I was amazed. <laughs> at the tape that they took out or the control center of the spacecraft. And I was a young kid in 1985. (laughs) Space vampires are an interesting idea. Not too bad for a wee daft film to watch for the black dog. And it's, it's available on Netflix. Part of the novelty. uh, I can't think of a better word is that the vampires steal life energy without biting anyone. Hmm. This was, uh, this is an extremely weird film. Bye for now, Doreen. Yeah, you, you're not kidding. Extremely weird film. That's yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Uh, that's an understatement of something, something rotten. I totally forgot about the net as well. Yeah, yeah. It's just like yeah. It's a football net. <laughs> it is. It, no, it's like a fishing net, like <laughs> like you'd have on an old galleon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, deploy the sample net, and it's like someone just brings out an onion bag. <laughs> Here's the net. That's all we got. Yeah, they we'll use that instead. I, I just, I just love the way they just cut to. Uh, oh, we'll bring, the, we bring these, um, these crystalline, crystalline coffins on board. How? Um, they're on board. <laughs> 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 but there you go. Yeah, how do they dislodge them? Yeah, are, are they stuck no, in the in the extended cut? They say, "Well, we better get one. Let's just just break one off." <laughs> Euphemism, <laughs> <laughs> because because uh, because later on, this when they get it back to the um, get them back to Earth. Frank Finley's going. Oh, those coffins! They're made of something. It's organic, but harder than diamond but stronger than steel, but clearer than the clearest glass and all this kind of thing. And it's like, so so you've just made a point of how incredibly difficult it would be to get these coffins anywhere. And then all of a sudden it's like, yeah, two guys two guys in spacesuits with an onion bag managed to lug three of them. <laughs> ah, yes, but they did, they did want to be found. It was, in the words of Adam Rakbar, a trap. Aha. <laughs> yes. <coughs> Good point. Well made. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that, Keldor, Doreen. And again, I was expecting a whole heap more uh, kicking on this film. So, uh, well done, everyone. (laughs) So, it's on to me. uh, And my next piece of feedback is from... Now, you're going to have to forgive me, a new feedbacker, because I'm either going to pronounce your name completely right or completely wrong. But if I say it with conviction, hopefully, it will be... A, a good fake. Um, Peter Labrino, or Peter Labrinos, or Peter Labrinos. Um, there you go. Peter. <laughs> not, not, Colin, not Colin. Not <laughs> Colin. Not Colin. Yeah. Peter, not Colin. There you go. He's got a superhero name right off the bat. <laughs> Peter, not Colin. Um, so, he, he writes, I'm not at all not at all. I'm a natural voyeur. <laughs> oh, God, that's the Peter Firth line, isn't it? I hope you don't mind as I'm about to brutalise this woman. No, not at all. I'm a natural voyeur. What? <laughs> just, just, what? 
Anyway, hello, Black Dog. Peter from the Great White North here. Um, I started listening to your back catalogue and is still looking for that elusive episode four. You'll never find it. It's lost in space and time. Um, but I only caught up around episode 263 last summer. Oh, my word. Um, <laughs> I wanted to feedback earlier, but the timing never worked out. I always said that if you do Life Force, then I had to write in. Well, here it is. Life Force. What can I say? I love this movie, and I always have. This is a great park your brain and enjoy it science fiction. The first time I saw this on VHS was in the early 90s. This was also the second DVD I ever bought. And I continue to watch it every few years and still thoroughly enjoy it every time. The only actor I recognised at the time was Steve Railsback's Carlson, from the first first season of The X-Files, where he pretty much played the same character. But the first thing that really makes this movie so memorable is, cue music, Matilda May, the space girl. This movie, <laughs> this movie has some great quotes. The space girl in Carlson's dream, use my body. And then when Carlson is getting rough with Ellen, he tells Kane if he wants to wait outside. And Kane replies, not at all, I'm a natural voyeur. And he sits down to watch the action. I love the score. Mancini did a great job setting the pace setting the pace for the action. I also love the love the alien ship. It's so well realized. Who knows? Maybe we'll see on Space Doc Jury in the future. Actually, yes you will. Uh, the next one we record, I will be covering this ship myself. Um there's a few things that bug me though. The special effects especially the creepy puppetry, were always certainly a product of their time, but still good and therefore can be forgiven a little. The Churchill, however, was set was also real, well realised, but I have seen schematics of the space shuttle and, we, and what we've seen on screen is way too big for that ship. The crew dying on board the Churchill also remind me of the Demi, Demeter, or Demeter in Dracula. Is it? What's the name of the ship in Dracula? Demeter. Demeter, that's it. I'm I'm on a real roll with pronouncing shit today, aren't I? Um. Anyway, as I said, I love this movie and looking forward to many more from the Black Dog. Buy from your other 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 man in Canada, uh, Peter. So Peter, not Colin. Peter. <laughs> he doesn't know he's called that yet, but he'll find out soon enough. So thank you very much for that, sir. Well, there you go. That's a proper enthusiastic love. There you go, Jim. Shall I pass on the Shall I pass on the email? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, for that Peter. So, uh, yeah, well, you can't argue with that, can you? Really? I mean, we have with the last <laughs> last forty five minutes of my bit, but you know. Thank you. I'm glad you liked it, sir, and welcome to the fold. And hopefully, we'll hear more feedback from you soon. Right. So, uh, Darren, who do we have next? Darren. <laughs> Darren. Darren, this is your mother calling. You need to wake up. <laughs> <laughs> and we've lost Darren. He's gone to sleep, hasn't he? He's gone. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is this is a standard recording of a Black Dog podcast. <laughs> We've hit the eleven thirty mark, and Darren has vanished. Well, he hasn't vanished because he's still on the actual Skype, but he's not quite realised that he's nodded off, and now all this is all going on in his head as a dream. <laughs> so I tell you what, seeing as he's really gone because he's really not hearing this, even though he is hearing this. But he's really not hearing this, is he? Who? You. Me? Yes, I am. <laughs> oh. <laughs> See, by magic, <laughs> the shopkeeper appeared. <laughs> Hello, Dal. Hello. <laughs> and I'm back in the room. Yeah. <laughs> yes, just one dollar to our Patreon will buy Darren an entire crate of Red Bull. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't cut this shit out anymore. You know that. 
Yeah, I know, I know, I know. But anyway, don't worry. You can do this one piece of feedback and we'll let you go so you don't need the MP3. You can go to bed. It's like, who do you have next, Darren? Who do I have next? Yes. Um, oh, fuck me. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking it, wizard gold. Oh, there it is. Just two pounds will secure a new host <laughs> for six months. Jack Woodgate. <laughs> There we go, Jack Woodgate. And Jack writes, Dear Lee, Darren, Jim and Elton, I remember renting Life Force when I was 14, so I can sympathise with the vampire's <laughs> victims, in that, after watching it, I found myself completely drained of fluid. <laughs> um, <laughs> mm. There was something reminiscent of Hammer's Quatermass and the Pit about it, but this was the era when horror sci-fi films were fun, Reanimator, Return of the Living Dead, Fright Night, and American Werewolf in London, etc. This was the po-faced and up its own arse, its protagonist dull and quite creepy, none of the, uh, oh, uh, none of which were heroic or endearing. You can almost smell the brill cream, silk cut, and the stale brown ale coming through the screen. Mm. For a film based on a story called Space Vampires that had naked, beautiful people running around, it took itself far too seriously. This resulted in me finding some scenes that were meant to be dramatic to be fucking hilarious. The emaciated uh, pathologist running into the cage and exploding. Colson walking from a nightmare and screaming for far too long. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. Um, (laughs) What appeared to be a puppet uh, of the hood from Thunderbirds (laughs) vomiting Ribena and Patrick Stewart's (laughs) fuck me eyes. Um... (laughs) As well as being dour, I found the film quite misogynistic. And I don't just mean uh, that John Barrowman's brothers had their knobs strategically covered whilst Matilda May's goods were on show (laughs) in just about every scene she was in. Mm. But the fact that the few women in this film were uh, were, uh, were the the main end... Sorry, sorry, one moment. Um, But the fact that the few women in this film were the main antagonist... Uh, credited mm. as merely a uh, space girl mm. uh, who was a living embodiment of a man's fantasy, the female astronaut who apparently uh, thought for some reason that all spaceships should have an android, uh, a couple of secretaries and a ginger nurse. In fact, the scene where Carlson was interrogating uh, interrogating her, he might as well have been yelling, the power of Connery compels you. Yeah. Uh, a lot of things were acceptable in the 80s, but this feels like a throwback to the 70s. A creepy middle-aged wank fantasy. <laughs> Although, given the budget uh, and who worked on it, one high reach, one with high-reaching ambitions. Cheers, Jack Woodgate. Thank you very much for that, Jack. Yes. Um, yeah. It. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not going to disagree with any of that, to be honest. Um, no. no. Cool. Um, yeah. That's it. Yeah. The, yeah, the the strange the strange thing of saying that the the nurse was like, yeah, yeah, she's a masochist. She wants it. I know because yeah. I'm telepathic. And then he starts beating the shit out of her, while while Peter Colin Fred Firth Fifth sits there and knocks one out sitting in the chair. I mean, it's just like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> um. But anyway, but yeah. Anyway, the, the 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 whole thing of smelling the brill cream silk cut and stale brown ale coming off the screen. Yeah, you definitely got that when you saw them running around. Because um, you know, I was saying it was BBC Television House. I'm pretty sure that a lot of those little corridors and hallways were actually the the, the production offices of somewhere like L Street or Ealing. Wouldn't yeah. have surprised me because they haven't changed. They haven't changed in like thirty years. <laughs> but anyway um yeah well thank you very much for that jack good feedback sir totally agree so um, i've got nothing else to add to that i'm afraid so um yeah now it's on to um oh jack uh jim who do you have next next we have another regular mm-hmm. mr matt jones um, aka danger matt <laughs> aka oh no i can't i didn't know you can't up. no no i can't i can't even do it because like youtube will just knock me it'll just have me <laughs> so we'll just have to go return of the man yes i do shep it do fall do doll there there sorry <laughs> yes i do 
See, I'm only going to do that because because I was hoping Darren would step in, but apparently not. No, I'll, I'll let you have this one. Fuck it. <laughs> you can have that one for free. <laughs> You're lying to me. <laughs> And hit the barrel. <laughs> there you go. I knew you couldn't resist. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't. Not where um, I, 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 I secretly sometimes when there's a full moon, I actually turn into um, <laughs> to the the guy Mark. What's his name? Mark Morris. <laughs> Return. <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake! Somebody give him a fucking biscuit. There we go. <laughs> anyway, sorry, Jim. Carry on. Anyhow, Matt writes, Good evening, fellas. Hope you're all well. So then, Tobe Hooper's Life Force. This week, opinions are sure to be conflicting, as this is an 80s genre movie that either works for you or it doesn't. I saw this in my early teens after I recorded it from a late-night showing on ITV and proceeded to watch it several times over the years, so I have a lot of nostalgia for the film. Yes, it's a bit campy in places, and a few of the effects look a bit ropey, but it's still a lot of fun to watch today. For a canon film's release, the scale of Life Force is pretty ambitious. The scale of the spaceship and space bats at the start of the film is impressive, especially in the longer international cut, and the zombie chaos and carnage in London really works for me. As for the cast, Peter Firth is a solid lead, while Steve Railsback does his traumatised astronaut act well enough, but the best acting comes from the great Frank Finlay and Patrick Stewart, who lend a bit of class to the production, whilst hamming it up to good effect. <laughs> then there's Matilda May, who, for a lot of the film, only has to roam around England in the buff, but is highly effective nonetheless, as I'm sure many a teenage boy from the 80s would agree. <laughs> Added to this, there's plenty of gore and fairly decent effects, although the Patrick Stewart dummy does look fake in hindsight, so you can see why it was a childhood favourite of mine. Last night, last year, I bought the Arrow Blu-ray that Jim mentioned, and it's a great buy if you're a fan of the film with extras galore. So, while Life Force may be divisive, I, for one, still really enjoy it for what it is, a bonkers 80s sci-fi treat. Canon may have made a fair amount of crap in their heyday, but Life Force has to be one of their better efforts. Cheers, guys. Danger, Matt. Thank you very much for that, Danger, Matt. Danger, Matt. Diddly, diddly, diddly. <laughs> I'm just trying them all out, just trying different ones out. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, thank you very much for that danger map. Um so, yeah, you're you're not wrong. It is divisive because I tell you, we're we're all over the show with the opinions on this. I thought we would either be strongly for or strongly against, to be honest. I'm glad that he likes the effects as well. I feel if mm. I'd seen this as a, a young kid. Yes. Especially that girl who was found in the the um, Hyde Park, was it? Mm. I think that would have terrified me as a kid when she started to reanimate on the on the autopsy bench. Yeah, that well, was really that was proper gruesome. Mm. Well, like I said, like I said last week uh, before we uh, before we wrapped up, basically I had that those images of those desiccated husks. Um, on the front cover of Fangoria, and I don't know if Darren's still awake, but um, I am still awake. Yes, you are. Um, but do you remember I used to carry him around my, um in um all my Fangorias in my bag at school? You had a fair few, yes. Yeah, well, I I got I got sent to Mrs. Mrs. Parkinson's office for those, and they got really yeah, and they got taken off me, and then and then the guy who used to ha- own the um. The news agents at Grove Park Station, yeah, uh, who used to sell them to me, found out that they'd been taken off me and wrote a very strongly worded letter to her. Oh, and now I got them did back. Did you get them back? Yeah, I did. I got Fantastic. them back. Fantastic. Yeah, he told he told her that she that it was all about sort of special effects and learning artistry and all this kind of stuff, and he basically got got her to give them back. Nice. So there. So there. Never Fantastic. underestimate the power of your local news agent. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, yeah. Mm. Anyway, um, yeah, the desiccated husks would have terrified a lot of people, but I, I had them on the front cover of a magazine that I was walking around school with. So yeah, I'm rel- well hard me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. We didn't have Matilda May. She wasn't in any of it. 
So why were they taking off you? Was it because there was like a a, a nudie lady on the front? No, because it, because it was because a desiccated. It was, it was actually a desiccated husk. It was one of the the husks on the on the slab sitting up with the arms outstretched. Ah, okay. And and apparently the uh, yeah the uh, t- the teachers see, saw me wandering about with them and reading them, and then I got sent to Mrs. Parkinson, the headmistress's office, and uh, yeah, that was the end of that, really. Who didn't know how to deal with it, and so decided, oh, do you know what, let's take him off of him. Yeah, that was it, take him off him. Um, then, like I say, I, I went to the news agents, and the guy just went, no, no, why are you, why are you, why are you buying like this one again? Because he would see me literally every week. Because he had loads of them, old ones, and I just yeah. went, "Oh, because they got taken off me." And he was like, "What? I must fix this." <laughs> well, he didn't. He wasn't quite like that. He was just like, "Oh, right. What's the name of your headmistress?" And that was it. And Is he Frank Finley as well? No, was, no. Was cause... Frank Finley, your 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 news agent. Well, if he was Frank Finley, you see, if it was Frank Finley, he would have already known. And he would explain yes, it to he me. He would have told me what was going on. And Frank Finley's dulcet tones, yes. he'll get them back for you. No, yes. as you can tell, I already know that you've had all your stuff taken off you, so I've already written ahead. But um, I'm going to study your reactions because, <laughs> um, look, a monkey, and then he just wanders off. Um, <laughs> ignore this large spike that I've suddenly got wrapped up in some brown newspaper along with my chips. <laughs> anyway. Hold this stone. Yes. <laughs> Hold. <laughs> you don't want to know if there's life after death, do you? No. In answer to your question, the answer is yes. <laughs> anyway. Um. Oh, he's always giving away spoilers. He's Frank Finley. Ah, uh, fuck him. Would you like to know what happens in the latest Star Wars movie? Yeah. No, no. Fr- I'm going to see it on the weekend. Uh, I... Well, in answer to your question. <laughs> Darth Vader's his father. <laughs> Cheers. Fuck. I've read all of the Game of Thrones books. <laughs> anyway, so uh, let's move on to our last bit of written feedback. And who is that, Elton? Uh, this one is from Gareth Lloyd. Aha. Uh-huh. And the subject from Gareth Lloyd is Life Farce. Oh. Hello, chaps. Well, I was pleased to see Life Force come up and have another chance to wallow in a high-class piece of old fat tat. <laughs> now, I've always had a soft spot for this movie, as it always felt like a big, big budget mashup of Quatermass and the John Pertwee era Doctor Who, only written by a hormonal teenager. <laughs> the opening is quite good, and the basic story could be made a sign, uh, interest in science fiction horror. But it's such a terrible script that the majority of the actors just seem to give up. Even Patrick <laughs> Stewart is terrible, and that's, uh, that takes some doing. Yep. However, this is brilliantly bad for me. It's huge fun from the terrible effects to the actors either looking bored or being eye-rollingly over the top. It's hard not to enjoy it. It's silliness, and in the way that I, I always approach it, is to imagine that Peter Firth's Colonel uh, Kane is actually a grown-up version of his character, Scooper, from the Here Come the Double Deckers. <laughs> Brilliant. Wow. And once you accept that, Life Force takes place in that universe, it makes a lot more sense. <laughs> right, that's it from me, as I bet this one will get loads of folks talking. So take care, Gareth. Thank you very much for that, Gareth. <coughs> Double deckers, bloody hell! That's good. That's they... good, man. <laughs> <laughs> right again. Any anyone anyone born after nineteen ninety, just get on Google. <laughs> right, I'm googling now. Yeah. yeah, that's that's the only way to say that. Um, right. Well, there you go. So that's the uh, written feedback done and dusted. Thank you very much for that, uh, Gareth. Uh, glad you like it in a kind of ironic, tongue in cheek kind of way. Um, uh, wow, Double Deckers universe, uh, a cinematic universe for the Double Deckers. That's that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's going out on a whim, going out on a whim, a limb, um, or whatever. I, my brain's not working. Blah. Anyway, moving on. Um, yeah, so let's um, move on to MP 
three feedback now. And we shall start off with Murray, the Pie Man Christensen. And let's hear what he thought of Life Force. Hello, Lee, Darren, Jim and Elton. Um, I apologise for the poor audio quality. Um, recording on a phone in a hotel somewhere in Basingstoke. Um, so the upshot of having a bit of free time in a hotel is that I watched Life Force. Uh, I mean, when you say upshot... I've watched some, some iffy movies in my time. Uh, I make no no qualms about it. I've watched probably more rubbish than I have good. And I've gone out and found more rubbish to find. I mean, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a glutton for this sort of punishment. Uh, Life Force, I'm still not entirely sure what I watched there, guys. Um, to be honest, it looked partly like... Um, it looked like a film made by a bunch of people who didn't even think they were making the same film. Um... You know, I mean, we've talked about script writing by committee before. You mentioned that where a script seems uh, just like it was put in to tick demographic boxes. That's not what this is. This this hasn't been made for any person, or at least not any any human. Um, th- this film was a kind of confused mess. So it started off very much like someone was trying to make Alien, but with 20 pence and a shoestring. Um and so they kind of had that of the crew going around and going around a, a duff looking derelict um, and then they find a nudie lady and decide to take that back and of course we then had the second aspect of the filmmaker's personality or the second voice in his head that was arguing for um, a film with lots of nudity in it so indeed they, they had her wander around mostly naked um, just about all the time in fact that was I think she, she wore the most she wore was like a sheet basically and so you kind of have that bit um, for the start, the sort of alien-style bit. And then when they go up and intercept the ship, you've got a bit of weirdness. And then it almost turns into a kind of... I don't want to call it a hammer horror, because it doesn't quite have that, but a kind of low-budget British horror film. So you've got weird things happening in a in a psychiatric hospital and you know, potentially vampires roaming about the place, but it's all very earthbound. It's almost like a sort of uh, gorified version of Doctor Who is a unit years um, but with that sort of weird, I don't know what, what was, I can't remember the actor's name the character was Kane who kind of goes around shouting at people and scowling and that's pretty much all he did for the whole um, film and then at the end it turns into some sort of crazy apocalyptic zombie movie um, and again it's just like a, it's like I'm making Alien, oh I'm bored with Alien oh I saw kind of a, a Hammer film with Moors and things like that, we'll do that, we'll go out to the countryside and and you know kind of abuse nurses that seems, seems uncomfortable um, and then oh, I'm bored of that now this is dull, Patrick Stewart is boring me now with his crazy antics uh, right, right, well we'll have a kind of apocalyptic zombie movie because god did that escalate quickly um, and then, oh, yeah, it's a fossil zombie movie. Oh, oh, yeah, we got a spaceship. I forgot about that. And then it naffs off. Um, yeah, that, that, and the film kind of abruptly ends. Uh, now, Jim did mention last week that there was an even zanier ending. Part of me wants to see it just to see if it makes any more sense. Um, or indeed, if there's a cut of this film that is coherent. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't be holding it too much hope. I mean, I think I'm going to have to like pull out one of the better episodes of TNG just to remind myself that Patrick Stewart is a good actor. I don't know, go and see Logan or something. Um, so yeah, I, I can see why this is a cult following. I can see this being the sort of film that people would get drunk and watch and have a good chortle at. Um, and probably has a lot of interesting behind-the-scenes stuff. Uh, I am actually going to watch that Canon documentary you mentioned. I saw it was doing rounds of film for, and it's currently sitting on my PVR. Sadly, that PVR is in uh, Scotland, whereas I am in Basingstoke, so not too much use for me for at least the next week. But on the upshot, I've got plenty of time to watch whichever film you're throwing at us next, so yay. Um, so all that remains for me to say is do keep up the good work, guys. It's always good listening to you, and uh, I'll hopefully feed back with maybe better sound quality, or maybe I'll just type it for the next one. Uh, but until then, bye for now. Live from Basingstoke, it's the Pie Man Week. Um, thank you very much for that, sir. Uh, good feedback. I. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, what was the crazier ending, Jim? Oh no, the ending is the same. Right. <clears throat> it's just there is a lot. I say there's a whole second base they go to. <laughs> um, I don't think it's in the theatrical cut at all. They mentioned they go to Nuke London in a couple of hours' time. Yeah. To sterilise it, 
Uh, but yeah, essentially, it does sort of fix what you mentioned about the geography problem, because both you know extended sequences of uh, Kane and Carlson fighting their way across London to get to St Paul's. Mm. That that's that's mainly the longer cut, and there is stuff earlier on which actually does. Um, I think it kind of it makes the plot lurch a little less, <laughs> <laughs> right? Because you actually get a bit of bit of background as to actually why this is happening, and you see uh, Falada actually figure things out a bit more rather than just and, announce them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the I mean the longer cut isn't perfect, but it's a canon film. It was never going to be perfect. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. And and yes, as Murray mentioned, the uh canon um the canon documentary, Electric Boogaloo, um, is uh, on film four if you're in the UK. And if you haven't seen it, do do check it out because it is just like what happens when someone when people have money and just go crazy making films which are shit <laughs> and slowly drive themselves round the twist it's a yeah it's an interesting documentary well worth a look and i've got lined up to watch later in the yeah week. i wanted is. to watch it before his but so watch it, yeah defeated by time yeah <laughs> no it's probably better that you watch it after life force because then all of a sudden it might throw everything a bit more into context to be honest it's, <laughs> it's quite cool um well anyway thank you very much for that murray good feedback sir And now we move on to our next bit of MP3 feedback. And that is from Whispering John Campion. So, what does he have to say about Life Force? Hello, Lee, Darren, Jim, Elton, and Mr. Space Owl. Well, this film is a bit of a mess. The dialogue is clunky. Poor Carlson and Falada are tasked with great big exposition dumps that seem to spring from nowhere. Uh, If they're challenged on how they know it at all, they tend to say, oh, I've got a feeling about it. The effects in the film vary in quality, and quite often vary in quality within the same scene. And yet, despite all that, and despite a badly lagging middle third, it's close to being a glorious mess. The budget, which was very large for the time, I think it's worth remembering that Back to the Future only cost six million less. Um, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome cost a full 15 million dollars less than Life Force cost to make. But that large budget pokes its head up once in a while. I think the light effects, particularly in the swirling objects in the room, both of which recall Hooper's previous project, Poltergeist, and oddly the slightly iffy effects like the dummy work recall the face removal from that former film as well. There are performances in this that rise above the film in general too, Um, Peter Firth treats the risable dialogue as though he were declaiming holy writ. You have to assume that he was directed to take everything extremely seriously, and he delivers on that handsomely. Also, you can't help but marvel at the way his trench coat stays so scrupulously clean, despite the amount of decaying vampire-ridden street he traverses and the number of vampires that he uh, that he's grabbed by, that he stabs, that he shoots. That coat is immaculate. Frank Finley's hair deserves special mention, as does his world-weary portrayal of Pup Falada, which I slightly wonder, is that a direction, or was he just aghast at having to deliver these lines at this point in his career? Matilda May, I think although for different reasons than when I first watched this film, is the heart of it. She gives a performance that's all unearthly grace under circumstances that must have been incredibly difficult. There's little touches in it, like in the scene at the end, the way she flexes her feet before she awakes fully. That uh, training as a ballerina that I believe she had shows in the way she moves i think it's also worth mentioning that for a vampire film there's a bit of role reversal here that she represents she's a female head vampire with 
two males that are effectively brides. She drives the pro plot along. She preys on the weaknesses of the men in the film. And unfortunately, the film undercuts that by its brilliant lingering on a naked body and by other scenes such as the interrogation of the woman in the mental hospital there's a bit of dialogue where one of the characters cracks a joke about recuperating with a pretty nurse but the germs of an interesting idea are there I don't suppose we'll ever get a reboot of this but if we did I'd like to see that angle explored and played up rather more so, on the whole, this is both a terrible film and a glorious film. That there are parts in it that I really like. The, as I said, the the way that Peter Firth just takes it intensely seriously. The way that most of the cast just seem to realise it's daft and run at it anyway. That that works very much in its favour. The Things that don't are the shonky effects, the dialogue. You know, the, there's only so much clunk that the actors can get past just by force of performance. And that middle third, which just really drags. So, yeah, a, a mixed one, this. It's by no means a classic. I don't think I'm anxious to watch it again. But we've seen worse films We've seen films that were worse because they were more inept. We've seen films that were worse because they were far more cynical, far more far more ridiculous, but not taking the ridiculousness as seriously as this does, if that makes sense. So, yeah, mixed for me. But on the whole, glorious mess. Pip, pip, chaps. Pip, pip, indeed. Thank you very much for that, sir. Um, good feedback. Ah, in- interesting conflict there, right in the middle, sort of. I, I, yeah, the 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 weird sort of both progressive and yet misogyny is kind of really odd. I didn't I didn't see it as trying to be sort of progressive. I just thought the initial bit of her being a vampire and leading the two male brides as it were as you say was was kind of like a good start oh is it recording are we actually getting any yes we are sorry my uh screen suddenly leapt there sorry ladies and gentlemen um it did seem like it was going kind of the progressive way but then like i say then then all mr floppy's got hidden away and then every five seconds (laughs) every five seconds we were looking pretty much straight up matilda may's lunch from from last week it was just like it was just and then you get like i say slapping the nurse around and all that kind of business and it's just like you know it yeah you just had to kind of go well okay maybe they had maybe someone had a good idea to try and actually make this a more progressive film than than the 80s would allow but well, well, no, the progressive stuff comes because it's from a, a 70s New Wave SF novel. Oh, yeah. Well, I was gonna say, yeah, actually, true. Yeah, the 70s. Um, and there's, <laughs> in, the, in the novel, there's a lot of the idea of about life force and how that's tied to, obviously, the sexual impulse and the kind of like the, the idea of like Kundalini and tantric sex of that, you know, they raise the life force and um, and how kind of. Every everything is vampiric to an extent, and that there are people who are psychic vampires, mm. and you know people who you know feed off attention and neg- stirring up negative emotions, and lots of really interesting kind of you know ideas like that. Wow, they could they could have a field day with the internet if they remade <laughs> exactly. it. Exactly, jeez. Yeah. Um, and you know that kind of sort of how you know people are emotionally parasitic. Mm. And, and that's in it. And there is, there is, there is, there is a, there is a scene where you, Kane does say, well, "I am a natural foyer," but in very different circumstances in the book, where mm. there is, a, you know, an expert who studied this, you know, sexual life force, and is generally a bit mad. Right. Um, but, uh, but then you, have, you, so you have that. But then you also have this is a canon film made in the eighties, who brought us such gems as the Lemon Popsicle series. That's where your <laughs> conflict comes. Yeah. Yeah, 
Where where would we be without a sort of Middle East pawn, a softcore pawn pretending to be masquerading as a an American fifties diner comedy? Uh, yeah, <laughs> just where would we be without that? Eh? Um, yeah. Anyway, thank you very much for that, John. Um, yeah, interesting feedback. I like you know sitting on yeah. I love the fact that he's saying like you know poor old Peter Firth is literally tr- trying to make this this shit script happen by just believing in it sort of like dorothy from wizard of oz just click your heels together and shout hard enough <laughs> this will make the script work well this is <laughs> i think you know, if you'd had finlay and firth as mm. a mentor and um strong arm man duo investigating this as the center of the film it'd be a lot better mm. it's it's steve rails back who lets the side down because he really isn't he's doing his best but he is you know Sorry, American listeners, but he was very much cast as we need an American in here. Yeah, and he ain't up to the job. <laughs> no, not really. I mean, thinking about it now, thinking back on it, I mean, this almost could be remade as a sort of tongue-in-cheek comedy with a sort of Monster Hunters style twist. Sort of do it, do it with all the the sort of sort of you know misogyny and everything thrown in there but done in a sort of ironic way um i don't know if you've seen it but there's a film out at the moment called love witch um i've heard about it i've not caught it yet yeah well it's it's the same sort of it's the same sort of deal it has the very has this kind of re- really of you know vibe of sort of like a 70s 80s sort of early 80s 70s sort of gaudy sort of hammer horror kind of thing and then you um but really what it's doing is just like poking poking holes in all the sort of the the misogynistic tropes of the films of that era and it's you know it's a little too knowing maybe but that sort of thing done with life force i think could actually be quite could be quite interesting as well um i think i think if you watch it jim i think i'd be interested to hear what you thought of it because it, there's clearly a lot of um nods to th- to sort of jello and and sort of the craziness the crazy gaudiness of that sort of era of horror it's really interesting but um it's also supposed to be a bit tongue in cheek and a bit funny as well but um yeah I will, I will be catching it as a I am planning to to do some crazy 70s witchcraft movies like I did crazy 70s satanism movies last year so <laughs> yeah I'm going to be catching the love craft the the, the, love, the love witch mm. Uh, a bit later on this year, when I uh, yeah. watch some of the original seventies kind of films, it's um, it's homaging. Riffing. Yeah, it's well, it's available on um, uh, digital streaming services now. You can actually rent oh, it. Right. So Blinkbox mm. and um, I, I can't remember what other ones like Talk Talk, you know, and all these kind of other streaming services where you can rent rent latest films. It's worth might be worth a look. Three quid will sort you out for that, I think. Um, but anyway, uh, yes, so take a look at that. But anyway, thank you very much, John. Um, thank you for that feedback, sir. And now we shall move on uh, to who shall we pick? Oh, we'll have Michael Cornett, of course, the belly stapler. Uh, let's hear what he has to say about Life Force. Good evening, Black Doggers. Good evening to Lee, Darren, Jim, and Elton. This is Mike Cornett, the belly stapler, your man in Baltimore. Oh boy, Life Force. What a movie. What a fucking movie. This is Voldar, coming to you from the planet Mars. Well, actually, from my exile on a penal colony on the on Mars' moon Phobos. Yeah, it's inhabited by pacifist fungus beings. Such fun. I managed to hijack this person's transmissions... And, out of curiosity, watched a movie, what you call a movie, called Life Force. Is this what the Earth has come to? Where they just have to fall victim to every, I suppose, attractive, naked person that they let their hormones rule them, and instead of blowing up the ship like a Martian would do, they bring it back to Earth, and then let chaos ensue? What? What do you Earth people do out there? Good grief. I mean, I've been following the Earth news, you know, because I want to launch my invasion eventually. 
and I'm finding out that you Earthlings are making a mess of things as it is. Holy crap. Instead of being the, the bad guy, the conqueror in this, I'd be the good guy coming in and bringing order to things. Thanks a lot, Earth. You're making me the good guy. But really, th this is a bad movie. This is such a mess. It's all over the place. It's a science fiction thriller. It's a horror film. It's a zombie apocalypse. You Earthlings really like that zombie apocalypse bullshit, don't you? You should be more worried about an alien invasion. Actually, I think you'd welcome an alien invasion by now. It's just so terrible. And, and that music by a composer who was just out of his element doing sci-fi horror music. And characters who you just can't tell apart at all. They have no distinct personalities. And that nude space vampire is walking around and everyone's getting hormonal over her. Good grief, Earth. You disappoint me. I thought the Martians were becoming Martian Mellows. You're becoming Earth... Um, uh, uh, you, you're becoming something. I just don't want to have to think about it. Yes, it's just such a terrible mess. I hated every second of it. And if this is the level of entertainment you Earth people have, yeah, maybe I do need to invade and enforce order and law and sense to this planet. And then you'll love me for it. Please love me. I need love. I didn't say that. I did not say that. This is Voldar, ending transmission from the planet Mars. Well, the penal colony on Phobos, with the pacifist fungus beings, who are so hard to get worked up to invade. Good grief, people. And then all those elements brought together and everything else, I mean, I have just presented a stunning and airtight case as to why, you know, Life Force needs to be regarded as one of the great science fiction films of all time. It is a brilliant piece of filmmaking. You just need to hear what I just said a couple times over to really understand what it is that I'm saying. It is brilliant. And I'm just, I'm not going to go over this again. You all heard it the first time. Anyway, this is Mike Cornett. Th thanks a lot, guys. I'm having a good time at work. I finished a huge project. They expected me to be working on this project for weeks. I finished it up on Thursday. So I'm getting ready to start my next project, and they're very happy with me. So hopefully they'll um, bring me on permanently, which is really good. Anyway, I will talk to you all later. Um, what's next? Is it Transformers? God, Transformers. Really? Anyway, mwah, bye. Well, thank you very much for that, um, Michael. Uh, a great, great rebuttal to all my comments about uh, Life Force. Um, you might want to uh, look into your uh, Wi-Fi password there, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, someone's piggybacking on that, bad yeah, boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone's. Yeah, it's. Yeah, you, I knew the NSA were getting sort of invasive. Uh, over there, but that's that's really taking the mic. Are you sure that um, Voldar's not jumping on your uh, Skype there, Jim, and sending out emails via your Skype? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> fake news. Fake, fake news. news. Fake news. Um, right. Well, there you go. Well, thank you, uh, Michael, and thank you, Voldar from uh, from Santa Claus Conquers the Martians. You uh, you fine mustachioed alien being, you. Um, yes. Yeah, I don't know how to best address that. I mean, do you address the fact that the alien liked it, or do you address the fact that, or hated it, sorry, or that, um, that Michael loved it? I don't know. Well, I think, I think it's a, it's a question for the ages. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll hear more from Voldar another time. Um, once, once they let him have his, another single phone call to his lawyer out on, uh, Phobos. So uh, let's move on. Thank you, sirs. <laughs> Honestly, sirs. Um, let's <laughs> let's move on to our next bit of feedback, and it is uh, the orgs, uh, Pete and Anne Marie, and uh, let's hear what they thought of Life Force. Hello. Uh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> you a bit shell shocked? That was weird. 
It was, but I enjoyed it. Did you? Yeah. How? how? The same way as I enjoy things like Red Sonja and Split Second. Oh, but they make far more sense than this 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 weird thing does. It, I mean, it's quite visually stunning at the beginning. Sort of promising start. And you think, oh, yeah, those good effects. And then quite quickly just descends into utter madness. Well, yeah, it's bonkers. I didn't say it was sane. <sighs> I mean, it's like Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, but with a budget. And some of the dialogue's terrible, the acting's appalling. Yeah, some of it is. It's, it's Star Trek the motion picture, the porn version, eventually. Yeah. Ugh. I mean, I just found it, after I started to really enjoy it, so when they started exploding into dust. <laughs> yeah, some of the, the uh, animatronic effects are really good. And there's that hand, isn't it, that's yes, stuck in stuck the... stuck on the bars. I yeah. quite like that, and I thought, oh, this is going to an interesting place again. But it just, it just changes direction so many times yeah. that you just don't know what the hell you're watching. And when they start blowing up London in miniature... <laughs> yeah. <sighs> and, yeah and, and Patrick Stewart is... Patrick Stewart was... Um, there are five lights. <laughs> uh, yeah, or whatever. And then, then he speaks with her voice and that's weird. No, I'll tell you what else I really love, though, but like in the When he stops way. vomiting blood and it... Yeah, the like, vomiting blood and it turns into it's her. thing. And then it goes slop on the floor. For no reason. Because just... reasons. I don't know. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, you suddenly get told that the female is attracting people and, and the, the male has to do a thing for the female <laughs> and then he'll go there because reasons. And you're just like, what? where did that come uh, from? Where did that... It's it's like a fever dream. It, yeah. I, I just... I'm not sure I'm completely well, to be honest. <laughs> and and he, she, she supposedly loves him, but doesn't know his first name. Yes, she keeps calling him by his surname all the time. <sighs> Carlson. 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 The name's Dave. Carlson. <laughs> uh, oh. Yeah, and it's also sort of like she's naked nearly all the time, and supposedly really sexy, but there's almost. There isn't any sex in it, is there? I not mean, there's much. kissing. I mean, there's a bit of penetration at the end, but not the but sort not she the was sort, looking no. for. No. Uh, no, which is a bit <sighs> odd. But, uh, and like, in the beginning as well, like they don't have an alarm button in this place or, no, or, or, or phones. They rush through loads of doors. They, they run down five sets of stairs and through loads of doors, one by one in order to get got, which is just, yeah. Yeah. Blah. But it's, it makes as much sense as Split Second does, I think. <laughs> well, Split Second's got a fairly basic plot that you can understand. It's really badly done, but this is just bloody weird. Yeah, but I liked it. I mean, it was wrong, it was bad, but I enjoyed it. Well, in all its in all its hairy bonkersness. You're just wrong and broken, I'm sorry. Thanks! <sighs> Says he who likes Star Trek fucking five. Yeah, that, that come on. What do you mean, come on? Star Trek Five makes sense. The, there's no, there's, there's uh, really Star Trek Five makes it sense. It does. Let's Compared all to go this... and see Spock's brother, who suddenly appeared out of nowhere that wasn't in anything else, and suddenly take a starship to God in inverted commas, which, as Kirk points out, why does God need a starship? Anyway, that's all we've got time for. Uh, yeah, yeah, Cheers yeah. Bye. See, see, see. Bloody hell. And away they go into the sunset. More marital bliss. We've done it again, haven't we? Yeah, we've we've broken up another another relationship. Just chalk it up. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a toughie. Would I would I think this is better or worse than Star Trek Five? Um, actually, I better think than Star Trek Five. Yeah, definitely better than what's the, I mean? If we're talking career low points for Patrick Stewart. Singing Gilbert O'Sullivan in a spaceship. Yeah, that's true. That's Is that yeah. Star Trek Six. That's Star Trek. All Insur- the cut price centibytes. No, that's the Insurrection. Star Trek Nine. Oh, good lord! There, yeah, they made more than more than six. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I think, I think, I think I would, I would much rather watch Life Force again than watch Star Trek Five ever again. So uh, there you How's go. The one that you did throw under the bus, isn't it? I literally? literally threw it under the bus. For those of you who don't know, I literally watched that film. I had a special edition that I'd imported from America. And after watching it for the Black Dog, I, I took it out of my DVD, walked it out into the end of my drive, and threw the whole fucking lot under an oncoming bus driving past my house. The box was destroyed instantly. The discs survived. 
I don't know what it means or what that proves, but yeah, just no, I hate that film with a passion. It's bloody awful. Life Force, you have boobs, but on Star Trek V, it's crewed by a bunch of tits. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So, uh, thank you very much. And if you want to hear more of Anne-Marie and Pete, and hopefully they've finished arguing by the time they get to the next episode, you can um, you can hear them on their own podcast, which is a Borgcast, which you can find at geekplanetonline.com and on iTunes. And you can hear Pete arguing with me and Andy Palastides on Space Doc Jury, which you can also find at Geek Planet Online and on iTunes. Right, okay, well then, on to our last bit of feedback, and that is Drew and Tracy. I'm sure they're going to love this film. I, I had high hopes for this. Like, I, did, I remember, like, at school, like, people talking about this. Like, it's the uh, 1985 kind of space vampires, and there's, like, some sexy chick that's in the buffy most of it. Okay. And so I really wanted to watch this. Well, why have you not seen it before, then? I don't know. I just think I forgot all about it. But I I really wanted to watch it at the time. And it just went. I forgot all about it. In fact, the only time that I remembered it again is when Doug said the other day, oh, you know, the next film is for the Black Dog. And I thought, I was like, oh, yeah. And you sold this. And and then, hold on, hold on, though. I was like, okay, uh, now I'm going to get my chance to watch it. And then, when it started up, the first thing was, Patrick Stewart was in the Street credits. Came I was like, credits. oh, this is going to be good. And then, I didn't, I, so I think I said to you, I said it's like a vampire like kind of film. Yeah. And it's like slightly sci-fi. And like the first like 20 minutes was proper full-on like sci-fi, wasn't it? It was like the, the UK and the US had a joint uh, space mission. Which you instantly went... No, it's not happening. Yeah, Mission Control yeah. Great Britain. No, I was like, happening. no, yeah. no, no, I don't <laughs> think so. I was like, so high hopes. See, we did, we we did smile with the opening credits because it was like, oh, Patrick Stewart and oh, Henry Mancini's doing the music yes, and oh, good pedigree on this. Doing, it like, looked like an expensive. And then as you production. say, for, like the first like couple of minutes, we we're like, oh, this is quite interesting, and then it just not uh, um, nose dived. I, no, I don't mean nose. No, dived. we did. No, but, it did. No, it didn't. I think that it got to a point where, like, I I said to you, have you any idea what's going on? And you went, not a clue. And then later on, you went to me, do you actually understand any of this? I was like, no. No. Nope. I think when you get to that point, the, the film is gone, isn't yeah, exactly. it? Yeah, exactly. So, like... just going to some points then. Yeah. So, when it starts off, right, so they're investigating, and they've, they've, they've kind of found a life force on this planet, didn't they? So they decide yeah. to get in their suits, right? And they, they, they go up It's and... a ship in Honey's Comet, isn't it? Whatever. I, I'm tuned out now. I'm just like grabbing what I can from this. Yeah. Right? So they get on their space suits. And first of all, I said to you, why are they not tethered to either like their ship oh, or to each know. other? And you're like, oh, it's but they've got like their... It's immaterial tray, believe um... me. Well, okay, well, I'm nitpicking, right? So they go into this vast the spaceship expanse, thing, yeah, isn't it? Like spaceship, and they see bats, right? And you're not yeah. seeing like little... Fruit bats. They're You're proper like, space bats. Fuck off, like vampire, space bats, yeah. nasty bats. At that point, I would have gone, nah. Get the hell out of here. Let's just leave it. This is here for a reason. Let's yeah. not go and interfere. But no, they fucking go in there, and he breaks the finger off of one of them. I know. Yeah, that's not going to come back and bite that you. That wouldn't make your day, would it? Asshole. Just leave. Reverse. Why did you only ever see the woman in the bath, didn't you? I had some real grievances with this. Every time you saw the blokes in the bath, there was a strategic like a shadow line over that the kind penis. Of, yeah, I was like, I want to see some jubblies here. What's going know. on? But you saw all the like, ghoulies were hidden. The women were just like tits and fanny. That's I like, know. I, I, I must admit, I like that, you but I agree that it, this was like not very good if you're a woman Especially and you want to see some ghoulies. Showed the two blokes, and I was like. Hi. Yeah, there was, was quite a different one, and then there was like nothing. I was like, "That's just fucking poor, poor out of ten." This film. Talking to Patrick Stewart, oh, I think it was about that time this man that we ever just... had any hair. I know, really. It was about that time where I just didn't know what was going on. Did you? <laughs> I was like, "Oh, I'm great that he's at last in it," but I was just no idea where we it are. Just got, started getting a bit dark, I know. and we were like, "What?" Uh, and then he started being like, you know, talking in parcel tongue quite a lot of the time him and that woman and it's just like this film's just getting a bit stupid 
I had high hopes for this film, and I do feel a little bit like perhaps I might fancy watching it again and trying to no. take it in. But I oh, know it's rubbish, really. No, I it's couldn't. Very really disappointing through how I built it up. Yeah, exactly. You you kind of very went, disappointing. Really, oh yeah, let's watch this. It's going to be really good. No, it wasn't. And halfway through, I was like. Yeah, no. It's an expensive production. It looked and it was like lots of good actors, but it didn't. No. If anyone reports back and says this is a great film, then they need their head examined. I suspect it's a bit of a cult film. I think it may be. I think you uh, misplaced one word in there. Yeah, one letter. It's a cunt film. (laughs) Actually, let's leave it there. Oh, I didn't like this. No. No, neither did I. It's rubbish. (laughs) Talk to you later. Bye. Well, there you go. <clears throat> Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Tracy. Um, yeah, they were fans. <laughs> I think that's all you can say, really. Made Tracy swear. It did. Made her say naughty words. Wow. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, um. I, well, by now, Tracy, if you got this far, I think you realise that actually there's a fifty-fifty split. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I didn't do a Thunderdome on this one. I, th- I thought I would have won, but yeah. it would appear that I didn't. Um, well, Drew's, Drew's right in saying that it starts off heavy sci-fi. Really? I, well, I think it does because, well, it it's all about space and spaceships and getting aliens and stuff. That's literally all over in six minutes. Yeah, I know. It starts off really heavy. That's not starting off. That's literally a title sequence, but just without letters on it. Six minutes. And, <laughs> I, I know, because it... I'm looking at it on my, my Twitter feed. Six minutes. It just nosedives <laughs> from there. <laughs> six minutes to walk in, walk out, go, oh, look at this alien spacecraft. Oh, here's an onion net. Quick, let's yeah. take these crystals home. <laughs> NASA in uh, Greenwich University. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is Mission Control Birmingham. Come in. Mission Control Birmingham. Um. Oh, and, and also the comment, about because now I'm looking at my Twitter again, uh, that comment about the um, guy who's floating right beside a, a lady... A lady astronaut who he's been with, and he sees this this naked vampire lady and goes and goes, oh, she's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I've been in, uh, and no wonder because I've been in space for six months. Oh, sorry, sorry, six weeks. Yeah, six weeks. And it's like, dude, I'm right here. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, you see me... that look she gives him though. Yeah. Exactly. Surprised, surprised she just looks and rolls her eyes. What? Exactly. It's like... <laughs> but it, then it cuts back to the... Then it cuts back to the Churchill. Oh, yes. Um, and, um, yeah, there's, uh, there's there's at least another three other female characters on there as well. Um, but anyway, not that that supposedly matters. But anyway... So, um, thank you uh, for ev- everyone for sending in feedback on this. Uh, thank you, Drew, Tracy... Uh, uh, for your feedback it's been that was that was a uh, a fiery way to complete the film i think is a good way of putting it and now it's time to move on to our next film what film we're going to do next well don't ask me why i came up with this one i i just for some reason i had a brain fart because you know what i thought i'd seen this film before and i thought i knew everything about this film before but then I realised I've never seen this film before. I've just seen bits of it and sort of patched together a mental collage of it. It's the 1986 animated Transformers cartoon movie. Transformers the movie. The last ever starring role in a film by Orson Welles. I don't know why I picked this. I really don't. Yeah, I, it's not even nostalgia because I've never even seen it before. Has, have you guys seen this? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. interesting. Um, and what do you think of it, Elton? Uh, for, uh, I think I quite liked it, but I can't remember. We, myself and Jim, 
once again did this on Witless. Did you? Yeah. Oh, and blimey. I can't remember what was said, but I've just gone through my IMDb and I've given it a six. So I could have, must have liked it at some point. So yeah, wow. I, I can't remember a single thing about it, although it has got a hot rod in it. It's got. I know. I know for a fact from from old memories of friends uh, seeing this film that it has a really cheesy eighties cock rock big hair soundtrack. Yeah, which I detest. Going, you get the touch, you get the power, mm-hmm. um, and all that kind of thing. But yeah, I have no idea what the film is actually like. So, um, has Darren seen this? I don't know. I th- we we both went through a big phase when when this generation of Transformers was on um, on TV AM every morning just before just before you went on off to school. So we had a big old phase of this, and I don't know if he ever saw it, but I know there was a few friends who had. So um, yeah, maybe he has, maybe he hasn't. We don't know now because he's he's gone off to the land of Nod, as people, as the more observant listeners will have noticed. Um, yeah, so maybe we'll find out. Maybe next week will be a interesting, interesting kind of view between people who've seen it already multiple times, and 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 me and Darren going. Mm. <laughs> So, yeah, so if you want to send in feedback uh, for Transformers the movie, and we are talking about the 1986 movie, not anything to do with Michael Bay or live-action Transformers. These Transformers look like old TVAM Transformers. It's G1 Transformers. Yeah, please don't look up any wikis on Transformers because, frankly... You'll be looking at a live te- teletext feed. The amount of times I looked on that for Space Dock, and it was literally updating before my eyes. Um, so yeah, so so some of the G One fans appear to be quite obsessive. Um, so yes, so if you want to send in feedback for Transformers the movie, uh, oh, I haven't asked you, Jim. Oh, fuck. I'll finish this bit. If you want to send in feedback, send it into feedback at blackdogpodcast.com. Jim, what did you think of the film? Um, <laughs> so I have no nostalgia value with Transformers at all. Mm. Um, I was too old for them. Yeah. And uh, I only saw this movie for the first time we did for Witless. Oh, dear. And I will say to people... Mm. Thought life force was hard to follow. Yeah. You might find this jumped up firework of a toy advert <laughs> migraine inducing. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> well there you go. See mate, see this is what this is what you get when I don't when I do things out of order. This would have been the great one to finish on. <laughs> now encourage people to send in feedback. <laughs> So, if you want to send in feedback after that glowing review by Jim, <laughs> then watch the film and send it into feedback at blackdogpodcast.com. Right. So, before we take off, um, gentlemen, would you like to tout your wares, Jim? Uh, yes, you can hear me on my own show, Hypnagoria, where I'm still deep in a zombie history. Mm-hmm. Um, however, <laughs> I now have to do a very quick episode the next few days. Um as a, a veritable legend of comics, Mr. Bernie Wrightson passed away, sadly. Yeah. So uh, this weekend, um, all going well. We are be doing an episode paying tribute to his life and marvellous works. And very marvellous they are, too. They were wicked. I used to love all of his stuff. In fact, he had a very, very Kevin O'Neill vibe. I don't know if that's if, because Kevin O'Neill was influenced by him, but it had a very vibe, that sort of thing. But anyway, sorry. I I should leave I leave it to you <laughs> to uh, to do the research and and tell us all about his marvelous work because it was brilliant. Okay, and what about you, Elton? Where can we find your stuff at the moment? Okay, well, this Sunday I should have two podcasts coming out: one on the Band of Brothers, which is part four of Band of Brothers, and 
What else? Oh, yeah, Grand Prix podcast, because that's all back this weekend. So uh, that episode should be dropping on Sunday as well. And you can find all that over at rogue2.com. Um, I could also encourage people to pop along to iTunes and give the Black Dog podcast and Hypno Bobs a five star review. <laughs> Thank you very much. You should be in advertising. I don't know about fixing lifts or any of that stuff, mate. Uh, uh, yes, please. <laughs> so if anybody would like to give Elton a job in advertising, then please do write to ElmanS at gmail.com. <laughs> right, and you can hear me on um, Space Doc Jury as well as this uh, thing, uh, Space Doc Jury on Geek Planet Online and on iTunes. And, uh, you yeah. know, yeah, give us five stars as well. Why not? And Elton, give him five stars for Shonky Lab, which is marvellous. The gigs episode was just had me in fits. It was really funny. Cool. Um, really enjoyed that. And I, yeah. Anyway, I, I won't say any more because otherwise I'll spoil it for you. Spoil it for people who want to listen. Um, so, I say I was there. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm not spoiling it for you, <laughs> you div. <laughs> Give him four stars. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Right. So until next week, when I will be very grumpy if Mass Effect Andromeda is as shit as everyone's been poking me for. Um, then uh, until then, we'll see you all next time for um, Transformers. So join us on, on Twitter at Black Dog Podcast and the Facebook group, which is facebook.com slash group slash the Black Dog Podcast. Until then, thanks very much for listening. Take care and goodbye. Nighty night. Ta-da. to it.